Okay, is it time now to get started? Let's get started then. Can everybody hear me, including in the back? Good. Okay, we'll continue uh, caches today. This is a fun topic, like everything else in this course. But caches have been extremely successful. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the biggest conference in computer architecture is called International Symposium on Computing, Computer Architecture. But a lot of people used to make jokes because of the prevalence of the cache papers in it. It's, it's the International Symposium on Cache Architecture. There's, you still see caching papers, not as much as before, but caches have been there for, for a good reason, of course, the locality principle that we've discussed, right? Locality is so strong that caches work and people use them. But it's always good to question, uh, what if you don't have locality? How would you design the memory hierarchy if you don't have any locality at all in your access stream, if everything is random access? Then, of course, caching makes absolutely no sense, right? Because you're, you're, you'll, you would cache the data in anticipation that you're going to access it again, but there's no locality, either temporal or spatial. You're random access completely. But that's not how the world is for most workloads today. That's why caches have been extremely successful and people have tried to optimize it a lot. But it's always good to think about that other part of the random access, which is the harder part, in my opinion. How do you access, how do you, how do you design a memory system that can capture, that can do well on those random access patterns? Okay. And we will see in this lecture that random access is something caches are not very good at handling. Okay, this is a summary of the last lecture. Uh, basically, we've covered ISA, microarchitecture, data flow, memory hierarchy, cache design. And we'll continue with caching today. Uh, this is the aggressive agenda. I, I really want to finish caching today, but we'll see where, uh, how far we can go. We'll talk about some issues in caching, more effective cache design, what people have tried to do over time, enabling multiple concurrent memory accesses and how that affects caches. It's called memory level parallelism. And hopefully we'll get to multi-core issues in caching, but if we don't get to it, that's probably a good break. Okay, this is the takeaway from lectures one and two, hopefully. Uh, we're gonna continue that. Basically, if you keep breaking the abstraction layers and know what's underneath, you can do, design better systems so you can understand and solve the problems. And that's exactly why we have paper reviews also in this course. Uh, the paper reviews are targeted towards getting you to think critically about what's written. What's written is not always right. What's written is not always the best. It's written, it may be good, but it's always good to critically evaluate what is written such that you can do better, right? So that's one of the purposes of the paper use, to get you to understand uh, what's written and also hopefully critically evaluate it. So I, I would like to spend a couple of minutes on how to do the paper use this is, because this is part of your homework one. Has everybody seen homework one by now? Yes? Okay, good. So everybody's aware of that there's homework one. There's also homework zero, so if you haven't turned your homework zero in, please turn your homework zero in. Is the deadline passed for homework zero? Oh. Uh, we would prefer if you send it via email as a PDF. Uh, I don't think we've specified that. So if you send it the paper version, you can, you can turn in the paper version right now. That's also fine. We'll accept it for this one. <laughs> but that's, that's, uh, that, that's because we didn't specify it well. I think for future homeworks, we'd like PDF versions of everything. OK? Say it again? Uh, so in the data flow graph, sure. What you can do is basically draw it on your hand, take a picture, turn it into PDF, and send it. That's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I do all the time, actually. When I correct papers, I write it by hand, take a picture, <laughs> and then send it. Yeah, the goal is not to exercise your uh, drawing skills, although that's a good skill for an architect to have also. <laughs> but not, not in this course. Okay, so I'll spend some time. Uh, any, any other questions on the homework? Not technical questions, but logistic questions like this? Okay, good. Um, so uh, you're going to be doing at least three paper reviews for homework one and more paper reviews over time. So it's important to uh, go through this. We have some s sample paper reviews online also. So what I would like you to do is to first summarize the paper. That's kind of obvious, hopefully. What is the problem the paper is trying to solve? What are the key ideas of the paper? What are the key insights that are posed 
in the paper? What are the key mechanisms if they're trying to actually, uh, for example, propose a new cash replacement policy? What is the key mechanism? And we'll, we'll actually evaluate some papers that way uh, in this uh, lecture. What is the implementation? Uh, what are the key results? How much do they improve performance, energy, reliability, dot, dot, dot? What are the key conclusions? So that's a brief summary of the paper. If the authors have, a, have done a good job, this should really be the abstract, actually. But I don't want you to copy and paste the abstract. I want your own summary in your own words, right? That's important. Uh, strengths, that's the second part. This is actually uh, important. Now you're critically evaluating the paper. What's the strength of the paper? Well, the mechanism is really novel, right? The mechanism is really cute or insightful. <laughs> that's the strength of the paper, right? Or the, uh, uh, or the writing is really well. But usually the novelty mechanism, those strengths are more important than the other strengths like writing. So does the paper solve the problem well? Uh, is it novel? Is it insightful? Uh, is it well written? Uh, I mean, the results are great is a strength also, but that's less important than the mechanism's insight, right? In the end, as you remember from lecture one, the purpose of computing is insight. The insight might be great. Uh, the, the results might be great, but the insight might not be that new, right? Then the results are a strength, sure, but insight is not a strength. That paper is probably less interesting from the, in the grand scheme of progress, if you will. Okay, I mean, you'll get used to evaluating uh, these works. Uh, and the weaknesses. Uh, that's, uh, this is, again, where you should think even more critically, perhaps. Uh, every paper or idea has a weakness. This doesn't mean that it's bad. Uh, it means that there is room for improvement. And in my, uh, in my experience, this is true for every single thing that I have read or I've seen. So you should look for uh, that uh, weakness in the paper or in the talk or in whatever you're evaluating that exists because that way you can actually make progress in the world, right? And uh, you can sort, uh, I, would, I would ask you to order, this is not written over here, but I would ask you to order the strengths and the weaknesses in terms of the most important one first to the least important one least. Think about somebody else reading this review that have, uh, who has never read the paper. You should really target that person with the summary, with the strengths, and with the weaknesses. So they should really see the most important strength first, most important weakness first on their weaknesses. Of course, you can always nitpick, and you can say, oh, there are a bunch of, there are two spelling mistakes in the paper. That's a good weakness to have also. <laughs> that's fine, that's a weakness, right? <laughs> it's better than having a thousand spelling mistakes in the paper. <laughs> Sure. And then the f fourth one is your thoughts and ideas on the paper. Again, this is where you can think critically. Can you do better than this paper? Uh, for example, if you actually think the problem that the paper is solving is useless, you can talk about a better problem related to it. Hopefully, the papers I assign are not solving useless problems. Uh, but that could be uh, one thought, right? Or can you actually improve the work in some way? Or can you take it in a different direction? and solve the problem in a different way, right? So this is actually, this is, this is to exercise your thoughts and creativity over here. Fifth one, takeaways. So, take basically, what have you learned, enjoyed, disliked about this paper? This is a little bit more free form, if you will, uh, that you haven't said before, of course. Uh, and fi finally, any other comments you would like to make? And basically, in, in one page, you can describe a paper uh, that way. And we have some sample reviews on the website, which you can look at. And there's a specific review website where you should create accounts on. Or have you already created accounts for everyone? OK, yeah. Well, you should have received an account from that sample review website also, uh, you can, where you can go and put in the reviews. OK, any questions? Good. So if you're at some point reviewing papers, reviewing talks in either academia or in industry, this is a good template to have, actually. Uh, OK, so when doing the reviews, I would suggest that you're very critical, thinking critically, exercising all those brain cells, firing them at the same time. Don't use a neural network to do this, because it won't be able to do it. Your neural network is much better, I think. <laughs> uh, so exercise all of uh, uh, your criticalness. And always think about better ways of solving the problem or related problems. Question the problem as well, as I mentioned earlier. And this is, I, I truly believe that this is how things really progress in science and engineering. Things don't progress by saying the status quo is good, so we should just keep it all the time. <laughs> right? Uh, then there's no progress. Only by critical analysis you can progress things. 
Okay, and sample reviews are provided online, so you can take a look at those. I mean, they're not necessarily the best reviews, so you can always do better than those sample reviews, right? Okay, if there are no questions, let's get back uh, to the topic of the lecture. Yes? There, there's what? There's an email about what? I can. Yeah, exactly. So you need to go, go and uh, log into that review system, and you'll see the papers. And you need to choose some of the papers to review. You don't need to review all of them. OK. If in doubt, you can ask the TAs. OK. I think we should really start using this one also, because this is our microphone, basically. If you want to ask a question, I'm going to send this to you, and you're going to talk to this. And the protocol is you're, you're supposed to send it back to me, not ho hold on to it. <laughs> OK, back to caching. Uh, basically, I'll go through this really quickly. We've talked about caches. We've talked about set associativity, which is multiple blocks can be stored in the cache in the same cache set or cache index. And we've seen the picture of a two-way cache, right? Where in the same set, you have two possible addresses in the tag store and other metadata also, and two possible blocks. This way, if you're doing accesses to blocks A and B, which happen to map to the same set, they both can be in the same set and you don't get cache misses, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. So it solves the direct map caches problem. Of course, uh, like everything else, it comes at a cost. It's more complex, as you can see. Uh, there are tag multiple tag comparators and figuring out which way actually you match in. It's slower access, and you have a larger tag store also because of this, because your tags are larger, as you can see. You Basically, you're reducing the number of index. Given, given the same number of blocks in the cache, you're reducing the number of index bits such that more blocks can go into the same index, have the same index. But now that increases the tag bits right, that you need to store. And your tag competitors are wider also. So we've seen this. If you want to do four-way, now you actually have fewer indices, just one index bit and four tag competitors in each way, uh, uh, in, in each set. and Likelihood of conflict misses are even lower, but now you have more tag comparators and wider data mux on larger tags. And fully associative is the nicest because you have the most flexibility in where a block can go in the cache. Right? All blocks in memory can actually uh, be present. Uh, in, uh, there, there's no index bit, basically. Now you, you, all you do is tag comparisons. Right? In, the, in that sense, there is no conflict misses in a fully associative cache because you're really bound by the capacity of the cache. There is no notion of a set, if you will, because there is only a single set. Make sense? Whereas here, there are two sets. So if you had more sets, you would eliminate that conflict miss. But here, you cannot have more sets. Right? There, is o there is only a single set. OK. So we've also talked about this. How many blocks can map to the same index? Uh, actually, I think I should phrase this better. I don't like the map to the same index. Uh, it's, it's a, because it's ambiguous, it should really be, can be present at the same index, right, within the same set. Okay, hopefully this will come up at some point. Okay, so if you have higher associativity, you have a higher hit rate, and we've seen this also, but then slower cache access time, and more expensive hardware. And as we've also seen, you get diminishing returns from higher associativity. As you increase the associativity, uh, at some point, your, perf your hit rate uh, maximizes. But of course, the curve doesn't look like this for all workloads, right? In some workloads, maybe you have a jump, right? From four-way associative to eight-way associative, you have a big jump because the access pattern may look like A, B, C, D, E, and repeating, right? If you have that pattern going from four-way to eight-way, buys you a lot. So it's really dependent on the access patterns in the end. That's why you, an important uh, way of designing the cache is understanding the access patterns be better and adapting the policies to those access patterns. OK, so this is where we left off, actually. We talked about this also. 
But there are a bunch of issues in set associative caches. Uh, and I'd like to uh, talk about this a little bit because cache design is uh, important. Uh, so you can think of each block in a set having a priority. Right? This indicates how important it is to keep the block in the cache. And the key issue is really how do you determine and adjust the block priorities? And there are three key decisions in a set. We've talked about replacement a little bit, but really when you're caching something, you're making three key decisions. One is insertion, the other is promotion, the other is eviction, replacement. So even when you insert, uh, you have a choice. Basically, you can change the priorities on a cache fill, right? When you're inserting a block into the cache, where do you insert the incoming block? Do you insert it with high priority such that it gets replaced later, or do you insert it with low priority? Or do you even insert it into the cache? So you have that choice. So if you, for example, figured out that the, uh, that access pattern, that block that you're accessing is part of a random access pattern that you're never going to reuse, if you can figure that out, maybe you don't insert it into the cache, right? Maybe the programmer knows the access pattern, and the programmer says, oh, this load, when it touches data, don't bring the data into the cache. This is called a non-temporal load. You can actually do this in some ISAs like x86 today. You can mark that load as non-temporal, and maybe the policy is if a load is marked non-temporal, that block is not cached. Make sense? So that's, how, that's one way of actually uh, determining priorities at insertion. But people have proposed other mechanisms also, uh, figuring out the access patterns dynamically in hardware and saying, predicting, is this block going to be reused soon or not? If the answer of the predictor is, no, it's not going to be reused soon. Maybe you insert it with a lower priority into the cache, such that you don't disturb the other contents of the cache. Lower priority meaning it's going to be evicted soon rather than later. Okay, so that's insertion. There's also promotion. What, do you, what happens to priorities on a cache hit? When you hit a block in the cache, when you access and there's a hit, what do you do to that block and everybody else? Because that's a point where you can actually make another decision, right? That gave you more information. Maybe the hit to that block is a good thing. You promote that block to, uh, you, 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 you increase the priority of that block such that it gets evicted later if you expect it to be accessed again and again and again. But again, that's dependent on the access pattern. Right? Whether and how to change the black priority. And the last thing is eviction or replacement. What happens to priorities on a cache miss? So which block do you evict? So this happens basically when you don't have enough space in the cache and you're trying to bring a block. So which block do you evict? And how do you adjust the remaining priorities if you evict at all? So insertion and eviction actually are coupled in a sense, but they're really different decisions. Make sense? And all of the cache policies that we're going to describe later on can be analyzed based on all of these decisions that they make. We're not going to talk about all of the decisions, of course, otherwise we'll spend the rest of the semester talking about caching, which you don't want to do. I don't want to do either. Uh, the goal is to finish caching today. But you can always analyze any cache policy uh, that way. And people have proposed many, many cache policies, again, which we're not going to cover. OK, let's start with the eviction and replacement policy. This is which block in the set to replace on a cache miss. Well, if there is an invalid block, that's probably a good idea to put your, put, uh, replace it. Replace meaning there's, it's invalid, so you're not replacing anything, but you're inserting the incoming block to that location. If all are valid, you need to have a replacement policy. Uh, and many, many replacement policies have, have been proposed. You can randomly pick, for example. If you have four-way associative cache, you can uh, generate a random number. And with one-fourth probability, you can pick uh, either of the four ways. This could work well sometimes. First in, first out could be another policy. Least recently used, which is the most popular, is another policy. Not most recently used is another policy. Least frequently used is another interesting policy, right? Of course, which one is good depends on the access pattern. We'll talk about some of these. So a lot of existing caches implement a form of least recently used or a simpler form of least recently used because if you are very highly associative, least recently used requires you to track the order of use, right? Which is very difficult to do if you're very highly associative, actually. We'll look at that also. But I think when you're thinking about the policies, it's always good to think about which one it might be good at. You may say random is a terrible choice, but it's not necessarily a terrible choice if your access pattern is 
something, which we may see. OK, so there are other uh, more fancy policies, for example, least costly to refetch. Some memory accesses may be uh, 10 cycles. It may hit in the next level of cache. Some memory access may require 1,000 cycles, because you may need to get that from some other me main memory, let's say, or maybe even main memory of some other processor, if you have a shared memory multiprocessor, right? So there is a difference in cost in the accesses, and it might make sense to take that into account in the replacement policy. Now, this is maybe harder to do, of course. So if, if it takes 1,000 cycles to refetch, maybe it's a good idea to prioritize that more, assuming it has some locality, because the other one that takes only 10 cycles to refetch, you can fetch it very quickly, maybe even without stalling the processor, right? So that's important to take, take that into account. So why would memory access have different costs? I've give you, given you multiple reasons right now, right? Maybe hit, depending on where it hits in the later levels of the hierarchy. That's one reason. It could be different caches. It could be different processors. It could be robuffer, in, whether, hits, whether the access hits in the robuffer of DRAM or doesn't hit. Dot, dot, dot. We'll see this more. Or you could have hybrid replacement, which we will talk about briefly also. Uh, maybe one policy is not good enough, right? You pick LRU. Well, sometimes access patterns, LRU is good. But sometimes random is a good policy to pick. So why don't you actually put both policies together and choose the best one dynamically? And people have proposed mechanisms like this. And existing processors may implement things like this. OK, optimal replacement policy. People have actually sought this a lot. What is the optimal replacement policy in the cache? And we will talk about that, too. OK, any thoughts? We'll cover a lot of these, actually. OK. So implementing LRU, let's talk about LRU since this has been the, one of the most popular. The idea of LRU is you want to evict the least recently accessed block. Uh, the problem is you need to keep track of the ordering, access ordering of the blocks if you want to do that. And there are multiple ways of doing it. You can, for example, have a timestamp for each block, but that, that sounds bad, right? Now you have time, time span comparisons. So let me ask you a question. So if you have a two-way associative cache, how many bits do you need to implement LRU perfectly? How many bits per set? Who should I throw this to? <laughs> if you get it, you have to answer the question. <laughs> so you have two blocks, way 0, way 1. Which one is the least recently used? That's the decision you're trying to make, right? Just one bit, exactly. Basically, one bit says, whether it's way zero or way one, right? That's it. You just need one bit per, uh, uh, per set to, to figure out which one is the least recently used block in that set, or which way is the least recently used block in that set. So this is easy. Of course, with two-way associ 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 associative cache, you can perfectly track least recently used blocks. Now, what happens when you go to four-way set associative? What is the minimum number of bits you need to implement LRU perfectly? Two bits what? Two bits per way or per something else? Per block. Somebody says block, right? Yes, two bits per block. That's right. And that would work, but that's not the minimum number of bits. So basically, two bits per block, such that every block has two bits associated with it. And 0, 0 means least recently used. 0, 1 means next recent, least recently used. Zero, 1, 1, 0 means next, next least recently used. And then 1, 1 means... I guess most recently used in that case. <laughs> but that's not minimum. Yes? Just two bits. Just two bits. That's right. You can, you can, that way you can keep track of the least recently used block, but you lose the ordering. So in the next access, you won't know which one's the least recently used. <laughs> so two bits is not enough. <laughs> Two bits per block is too much. Two bits overall per set is not enough. Well, now you need to think about probability. <laughs> so we have four blocks. Should I wait, or should I <laughs> give you the answer? Well, I guess that's the question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, you got the answer, basically. Yeah, basically, you need to think about how many different possible orderings are there when you have four blocks. And by probability, you have four blocks. Uh, one of them, uh, four, uh, four of them can be least, uh, least recently used. And then once you pick that one, three of them can be the next. Once you pick that one, two of them can be the next. Once you pick that one, four, one of them can be the next. So it's really four times, three times, two times, one. Four factorial different orderings are possible, right? That's 24. And if you're in a binary system, log two of 24 is five bits, and you need to get the ceiling. So basically, you need five bits to implement LRU perfectly. Does that make sense? If that doesn't make sense, you should think about it. Basically, you should think about how many blocks are possible to be located at the least recently used position, and you'll get immediately four. And then the next position, once you decide this one, the next position, you get only three choices. The next position, you'll get two choices. The next position, you'll get one choice. So that's 24 possibilities, five bits. Uh, well, I guess I've given you the answer. How many bits are needed to encode the LRU order of a block? So that's five bits, basically. That's the answer. How many different orderings are possible? That's 24. What is the logic min needed to determine the LRU victim? Now you need to have a decoder, though. <laughs> Right, you have 24 different possibilities. You need to decode and figure out which block, which way is really uh, the least recently used. Now that becomes complex right, with that ordering. So if you have two bits per block, it's perhaps easier logic to determine which one. Okay, we can do this exercise uh, more. So if you want to have a 32-way set associative cache, now you have 32 factorial orderings. And then even the number of bits becomes unreasonable right, at that point in time. That's exactly why modern processors do not implement true LRU, also called perfect LRU, in highly associative caches. And you can easily find 32-way associative caches in today's processors, especially last-level caches. Uh, OK, so what, uh, well, that's the reason, basically. And there, there are two reasons, actually. One is it's complex. The other is even LRU is an approximation, right? Why is, why, do, why is LRU a, a good replacement algorithm, least recently used? Because you're really predicting that if you haven't used it for a while, you're not going to use it again. Right? And you're predicting that it's, it's really an ordering that you have. It's really based on the cyclic re-reference model of programs. People have, when they thought about programs, think of a loop. You're traversing an array. Let's assume that you're always doing accesses to A, B, C, D, E in a given set. A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. Maybe the least recently used is not uh, uh, the one that's going to uh, that you're going to need uh, for a while, right? Okay. Um, so maybe it's not. But by the way, what, what I just said actually may be bad also if your if your associativity is low. Yes. Uh, access recently. Well, uh, yeah, in, in, when you're evicting cache block, yes, you need to figure out which one is uh, uh, the least recently used in this. That's right. It does increase the critical path of eviction. But hopefully eviction is not in the critical path. You can take multiple cycles to do that, perhaps, right? OK, so I allow you an approximation to predict locality anyway. Maybe it's OK not to be perfect in it, right? And that's one of the other reasons why uh, modern processors don't implement. So for example, some processors implement not MRU not most recently used. This is easy to track, right? Most recently used uh, way. And again, that there's a, another question here. How many bits do you need to track the most recently used way? You just need the pointer to that way, right? If, way, if you have 32 ways, you just need five bits. OK, that's easy. Or hierarchical LRU. So they sometimes divide the n-way set into m groups track the MRU group and the MRU way in each group. That way, again, you lose some information, but uh, you know which group is MRU, and you know which, uh, within, within each group, what is MRU most recently used. Right. And there's also something called victim next victim replacement, which I'll very briefly cover. You basically keep track of the victim and the next victim <laughs> and in a different way. <laughs> so you basically, one way of thinking about this, you, could, you basically keep track of the most recently used and the next most recently used, and do not evict them. Right. Well, this, it's the opposite, basically. <laughs> OK, so let's look at hierarchical LRU. 
uh, or not uh, in a not MRU way. Basically, you divide a set into multiple groups, keep track of only the MRU group, keep track of only the MRU block in each group. I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but on replacement, you select the victim as a not MRU block in one of the not MRU groups. And you can randomly pick one of such blocks or groups, right? Whenever you make a choice, you have a random choice. As long as you don't pick the not MRU one in the group and not MRU group overall, this is saying, okay, it's good. So it's an approximation to the least recently used, right? But it's not perfect. And there could be an exercise like this. Uh, what is an access pattern that performs worse than trail are you? You can have a 16-way cache and two eight-way groups. You can easily construct an access pattern that performs worse than true LRU, but you can easily construct an access pattern that performs better than true LRU also. So in the end, the performance is really dependent on your access pattern. That's why it's good to have some flexible policies. Okay. So a victim, next victim, again, very quickly, this, these are just examples. The, different processors implement different forms of it uh, in their caches. Uh, so what this does is you have only two block status tracked in each set, victim and next victim. All other blocks are ordinary blocks. When you get a cache miss, you replace the victim. Obviously, that's why it's called a victim. Uh, you demote the next victim to victim. Now that victim, that becomes the next victim. Uh, that becomes the victim. And you randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim. Make sense? Maybe. <laughs> Depending on some access pattern, this may make sense, right? Uh, on a cache hit to victim, you demote the next victim to victim. Now, next victim becomes a victim. And you randomly pick another ordinary block as next victim. But the, the one that was victim, but it got hit on, you basically say, oh, I'm not going to evict it because I'm expecting that it's going to be accessed again, right? That's the idea. When you get a hit, the expectation is that you're going to get more hits on the blocks. And this, that's, that's the temporal locality principle again or spatial locality if your blocks are larger than a word, which is uh, almost always the case. And you turn the victim to an ordinary block because you just hit on that. Okay, on a cache hit to the next victim, again, you expect, uh, because you've hit on the next victim, you want to make it an ordinary block, so you randomly pick another ordinary block as next victim, you turn the next victim ordinary, and you do nothing else. <laughs> When I cache it to an ordinary block, you do nothing. <laughs> victim doesn't change, next victim doesn't change. So you can see that this is really simple, right? You can implement this with very few number of gates. And you just need, again, tracking the next victim and the victim. Make sense? So hardware architecture is a lot about approximations like this. And in this case, I, I, I talk about these because uh, this shows you that whenever you're al uh, implementing an algorithm in hardware, you really need to, need to think about its simplicity. It's not like a software algorithm where you have more resources. It's always good to be efficient in the software algorithms also, but in hardware, you're very limited by the hardware resources. So this is an example over here uh, my, with my terrible hand drawing. <laughs> As you can see, this could be uh, uh, the victim and next victim status of different blocks in the cache, A, B, C, D. And you can have one bit specifying victim and one bit specifying next victim. That's not the best way of doing it. But in a two-way, in a four-way associative cache, which is the assumption here, this may be uh, uh, a simple way. Although it's not the best way, right? You have two, two bits per block in this case. In a two-way associative cache, the minimum number of bits to, uh, to keep track of victim and next victim is how many? For victim, you need two bits to decide which, uh, to, uh, to have as a pointer to which way. For next victim, you also need two bits. So the total number of bits is really four bits, right? In this case, I have two bits per block over here, which is eight bits. Okay, but if your victim is this way and next victim is this way, and if you get a hit to A, which is hit to the victim, you basically turn that into an ordinary block. It's neither the victim nor the next victim. And then you randomly pick one of these zero, zero blocks as the next victim. Of course, you need some logic to do that. OK. Any questions? Is it fun so far? How to, how, how to be frugal about bits is a good idea. But then your logic complexity may increase. So there, there's always a trade-off between logic complexity and storage overhead. OK. Another question. LRU versus random. Which one is better? What's the answer? Anybody? Uh, do we have to implement hardware to uh, make it random? I mean, it's random. It's randomly made a hardware. 
That's right, yeah, you need some hardware, yes. So, mm. Well, uh, ignore the cost over here right now. Which one's better in terms of performance? <laughs> There's a w one watt for random. Who else has random? It looks like you're outvoted. <laughs> Who's, who says LRU? We have two people. <laughs> who says it depends? There you go. <laughs> I guess I, I le lead you to the answer. <laughs> but yes, I think the answer is it depends in the end. Again, it depends on the access pattern, right? In ter it turns out if you do large scale studies on average workload and average them over across workloads, these two are similar in terms of performance. Because there are a bunch of random access workloads that, where you, you, if you pick the random, if you pick a block to cache randomly, you're, you're, you're better off. But there are a bunch of workloads that are friendly to LRU also. So let me give you an example. If you have a four way cache, and if you keep doing cyclic references to A, B, C, D, E, and they all map to the same set, LRU hit rate is 0%. Whereas random hit rate is something that you should calculate on your own. But if you pick randomly, you will have something in the cache that you're going to hit later on, actually. Make sense? So that's one example. So this is an example of set thrashing when the program working set is in a set is larger than the set associated. Working set is the uh, data block, set of data blocks that you reference at a given time. If that program working set is greater than the set associativity, you're really thrashing the cache. In this case, it's A, B, C, D, E. Your working set is five blocks for that set, and that's greater than four. So L in that case, LRU is terrible. In that case, random replacement policy is better when thrashing occurs. That's true for capacity also. If you're thrashing the capacity of your cache, you may decide to pick randomly, oh, I'm going to keep these blocks in the cache. Assuming you have some locality in the access pattern, you're going to get those get hit hits to those blocks. But if you're doing LRU, actually, that's, this is a pathological case for LRU. So in practice, it depends on the workload, of course. As we, so many answers to my questions in this class will be depends. So you can always answer correctly when you say it depends, but you, you, should, you should also say what it depends on, right? <laughs> it depends on the workload and the access pattern in this case. And as I said earlier, across a large number of studies, it turns out the average hit rate of LRU and random are similar. Yeah, that's interesting. I think maybe LRU is slightly higher. <laughs> and LRU is, we know how to approximate it and implement it, actually. Random, it requires some random selection logic, as, uh, as you mentioned. But yes, it's, it's, not, it's not always uh, that they use, uh, they use LRU. There, there have been some processors that used random. But LRU, an approximation to LRU is more, more popular today. Okay, so best of, best of both worlds, maybe you can have a hybrid of LRU and random, right? And we will talk about that later. How do you choose between the two? Let's defer that later on. Because if you have, actually have two policies, now you have a choice. How do you figure out which one to implement? Uh, which one to not implement, which one to use for the cache, or maybe for a given set? So now your hardware cost can become higher, right? But maybe you get a better performance. Okay, this is one of the readings that you're going to do for the next thing. But we're going to talk about that also. Okay, let's go back. And what is the optimal replacement policy? I asked this question earlier, and people have thought about this. Uh, someone called Bellady actually uh, wrote a paper on it in 1966 uh, when they talked about, actually, page replacement algorithms, because it's very similar, right? If you think about a cache being a cache for main memory, the main memory is a cache for the disk also. And similar issues exist there, except main memory is huge today. But basically, uh, the idea Bellady has w had was uh, the optimal cache policy is the cache, policy, uh, cache replacement policy is the policy that replaces the block that is going to be referenced furthest into the future in the future by the program. Sounds reasonable, right? Of course, this is hard to implement. <laughs> How do you figure out what's going to be referenced furthest into the future? LRU is an approximation to this, clearly. Uh, and even simulating this is hard. I'm not going to make you do it. <laughs> So I guess there are several questions over here. Uh, is this optimal for minimizing the miss rate? Yes? Who says yes? 
<laughs> now people are scared. It's not it depends in this case, sorry, I'll give you the, <laughs> there is a single yes or no answer. <laughs> Who says yes? <laughs> no? No answer. <laughs> this is optimal for minimizing the miss rate, right? Because uh, if you actually replace a block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future by the program, by definition, you're utilizing your cache in the best way. You know exactly what's going to be referenced when. And you keep in the cache the thing that you're going to reference next. So it should intuitively minimize your cache miss rate. And if you want the proof, you can read the paper. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. But is this optimal for minimizing execution time? That's a totally different question, actually. Your miss rate may be minimized. You can have, let's say, four misses only. But your execution time may be higher. And I'll, go, I'll show you. Well, we've already discussed it, actually, right? This doesn't take into account cache miss latency or cost. The furthest, uh, the block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future by the program may be a block that, if you miss in the cache, you're going to take only five cycles to get it back. Whereas the block that you're going to, uh, well, the, you, you want, maybe, maybe, okay, let me rephrase. That block may be very expensive block, right? The block that you're going to reference further into the future, it may take a million cycles to get it back. Whereas the block that you're going to reference next, it may take only two cycles to get it back. Which means that by not taking into account this miss latency cost, mis latency or cost, you may make the wrong decision to minimize the execution time. You make the right decision to minimize the miss rate, but that block is very costly. Right? So this is optimal in terms of minimizing the miss rate, but not the execution time. Because, and keep this in mind because in modern processors, cost is a big, uh, how long it takes to service a miss is really important. And it's very varied. It depends on where the block is. Okay, so one is uh, where uh, it can be your next level of cache, it can be in your some other cache, uh, later in the cache hierarchy, it can be in some other processor's cache. And also we will see that uh, some misses are overlapped. So if you get a cache block, cache miss, that miss may be the only miss that's outstanding. And if you remove that miss somehow, you, c you unblock the progress uh, of the processor. You can make progress. If that's the only miss that's required to unstall the processor, that's an important miss. But think about another uh, cache block where uh, a processor has five outstanding misses at the same time. It's waiting for all five to make progress, different instructions. Why does this happen? Because of out-of-order execution, for example, right? If you're waiting for all those five misses, and if you remove only one of them, it doesn't help your performance much because you're going to wait for the other four anyway, right? If you remove two of them, Again, it's not going to help your performance much because you're going to wait for the other three anyway. If you really want to make progress in those parallel misses, you really need to remove all of them at the same time. So five misses at the same time. In that sense, if you don't remove all of them, then you don't make progress. Which means that serial misses are more important for performance than these parallel misses, right? If you have a miss that's outstanding alone, maybe you should prioritize that in your cache. Because if you remove it, if it's cached, that's good. You make progress. So that's one of the other ideas over here. And that's the paper that you're going to read uh, and we're going to talk about briefly as well. So it's always good to think about when you're doing caching. Uh, so my point over here is really about miss rate versus execution time. Miss rate is not necessarily perfectly correlated with execution time. There are many, many other things that go into your execution time, like the overlapping of the misses, where the miss occurs, Dot, dot, dot. Okay, that's your reading. So I think uh, the key observation in this is some misses are more costly than others as their latency is exposed as stall time. They're not overlapped. Uh, reducing miss rate is not always good for performance, and cache replacement should take into account this memory level parallelism of the cache misses. But I'll talk about this a little bit more. So given that I've talked about Bellady and page replacement, let's take an aside. Uh, we've been talking about caches in hardware uh, or caches that are close to the processor, but caches are also far away from the processor also. And physical memory is a cache for disk. Right? And you've seen this in the virtual memory classes that you've seen. 
this is usually managed by the system software via the virtual memory subsystem. Right? By demand paging, you manage it. As opposed to a hardware cache, it's really managed by the hardware, right? And pay, but page replacement is similar to cache replacement, actually. Uh, page table is really a tag store for a physical memory data store, right? You're really keeping the tags <laughs> and metadata. You can think about the tag store as a metadata store. It's really uh, the data you keep in the uh, data store and the metadata about that data you keep in the tag store. So what is the difference between uh, a hardware cache versus this uh, page, uh, page tape, uh, uh, the physical memory? Well, there are two differences, I think. One is the required speed of access to the cache versus physical memory. Cache, a hardware cache, you need to access it really fast, whereas physical memory, it's already slow anyway. It's not as slow as the disk, but it's already slow. And the number of blocks is a huge, uh, very different also. Basically, uh, in a cache, you can have thousands of blocks, let's say, even with large caches. Let's say you have a, a 128 megabyte cache. Your block size is 128 bytes. That's a million blocks, right? Which is still much, much less than the physical memory blocks. And also, the, uh, as a result uh, of both of these, you have a tolerable amount of time to find a replacement candidate. So you have a disk latency. So whenever you replace something from main memory, you're bringing something from the disk, right? It may be a hard disk, it may be SSD, but that, disk, that latency is very long also. So you can make a much more intelligent decision in terms of your replacement candidate, potentially. And role of hardware versus software also, right? In that case, you can actually have a software replacement algorithm. And you've probably studied software replacement algorithms for page replacement. Do you guys remember? Yes? OK. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe you're not thinking about the page table. Maybe you're thinking about the page caches. Uh, so page table size is really fixed by the instruction set architecture. Page sizes, yes. Page sizes, yes. You can, you can basically choose a four kilobyte page size or a one megabyte page size. Yes. But that does, uh, sure, that does, uh, that does change the page table size. But there's another trade-off over here, which is really the page size. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's true, actually. Basically, what you're saying is another difference is uh, uh, you, you can have multiple page sizes in uh, physical memory, whereas that doesn't seem to be happening in hardware. You, do, you don't have multiple block sizes, right? That's true, actually, yes. <laughs> and uh, we will talk about that block size trade-off. Maybe we can uh, talk more about that later on. Any other thoughts? How many of you have, uh, understand this perfectly because you've had the virtual memory lecture before? OK, how many of you are lost? Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, you should go back and brush up on the virtual memory a little bit, yes? That's right, yes. It could, right? Depend on, it depends on your physical memory uh, size. If your physical memory is not enough, sure. then you will you always need to replace something. So if you find that that's enough, then that's not a problem, right? But it's, it's still happening in the background that something is being replaced. Maybe you don't have a swap space, but it's, it's, somebody is handling that replacement. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you don't have a dedicated space to buffer those things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, actually we'll take a break soon, but uh, maybe we'll cover some more and then take a break a little bit later. So what's in a tag store entry? Um, so when you think about the page table there, you can think about the page table entry also. It has similar things, actually. Uh, you can have a valid bit. Basically, that's, that indicates whether the, uh, let's go back to caches. 
where the block is valid. You need the tag, of course. Uh, and you need replacement policy bits, right, as we've discussed earlier. But you may need other things also, right? A dirty bit, for example. Whether you want to write back the block or write, uh, so that, 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 that the dirty bit indicates whether you've stored into the block, whether you've changed the contents of the block since you fetched it. Of course, you need the dirty bit if you don't concurrently update memory at the same time as you update the cache. So there is a choice over here, write back versus write through caches. So let's talk about handling writes. We have not talked about handling writes as much. But handling writes actually complicates caching a little bit. So when do we write the modified data in a cache to the next level? That's one of the key questions in handling writes. You have a store into your cache. You change the data. The data is modified. If your choice is to not keep uh, the data, modified data only in the cache, but also send it to the main memory, that's called a write through cache. So at the time when, you, when the write happens, you write into the cache and also you write it into the next level. Right. That's called a write through cache. And this doesn't need a dirty bit per block, right? Because dirty bit indicates that you, you have something different in the cache than the next level. And when you write it back, you should really write it back, right? Whereas in a write back cache, uh, you, you write the cache block, you write into the, ca uh, you write into the uh, next level when the block is evicted. You write into the cache, you keep the modified data into the cache, you don't expose it to anywhere else in the memory hierarchy. But when the block is ready to be evicted, then you need to send it back, right, to the next level. Now this is not an op uh, when you evict a, evict a block that's not modified, you don't need to write it back to the next level, right, because the, Next level already has the up-to-date copy. So this is not a problem when you're not doing writes. Only when you're doing writes, uh, you need to write back on eviction, assuming you're not a write-through cache. Okay, so this is, even this is a design choice, right? Write back, what's the benefit of it? The benefit is that you can, if you're doing a lot of writes to a cache block, you can do all of them in the cache without exposing any other part of the system to those writes. Let's say you have 64 bytes, and you're writing to every one of them, 64 different writes. All of them can happen in the cache, right? And this potentially saves bandwidth between cache levels and saves energy because those writes are just buffered in the cache and they don't go out, which could be nice. The downside, of course, is you need a bit in the text or indicating the block is dirty or modified, right? That's a problem. There's also another downside when we talk about coherence, actually, because now you ha you're, you're, you're not coherent. Okay, so write-through is, it's simpler, right? There's no uh, bits in the tag store. And all levers are up-to-date. Okay, now we are talking about coherence, actually, uh, or consistency. Basically, now you can have a simpler cache coherence because there's no need to check the close to processor caches tag stores for the presence of a block, right? Now, what does this mean? If some other processor needs this block, you don't need to check the cache that has done right through, right, for the up-to-date value. If you, if you have a tag store that just stores uh, the tag, uh, tags of other levels, you can just check that one. Make sense? This will become more clear when we talk about cache coherence, and some of you already have the background on cache coherence. But right through simplifies because now everything is uh, up-to-date. All of the other levels are up-to-date. The, the downside is, of course, write through is more bandwidth intensive because there is no combining of writes. You keep sending all the writes down into the uh, uh, next levels of the cache hierarchy. Does that make sense? Okay, if you haven't fully understood the cache coherence, we'll get back to it when we talk about cache coherence. Okay, so there are other options on a write. Uh, one other option is do we allocate a cache block on a write miss? So whenever you. Uh, you're accessing, you're doing a store to a memory location, and it's not in the cache. What do you do? Do you allocate a cache block? This is called a write miss. Do you allocate a cache block, or do you not allocate a cache block? And that's a choice. In a sense, this is not different from uh, allocating a cache block on a read miss, right? Whenever you're reading a cache block and it's not in the cache, you always have a choice. Do you bring it into the cache, or do you not bring it into the cache? Writes are a little bit special, because they're writes, right? They're a different request type. Uh, that's why people have actually concerned themselves with, it, with them a little bit differently. 
so if you allocate on a write miss, this could be good if you can combine writes uh, on that block instead of writing each of them individually to the next level. Basically, you can get the write combining effect. And it's simpler because write misses can be treated the same way as read misses, assuming you're bringing all of the red, uh, whenever you have a read miss, you bring the block into the cache. Now the downside is it requires a transfer of the whole cache block. Right? What if you're just writing to a single byte and you're not going to do anything else with the block? You're not even going to read it. Let alone read it, you're not even going to write to it again. Right? This is another form of locality, right, basically. And we're going to try to fix that problem a little bit. So in a sense, this is not different from reads. I'm talking about this context in the context of writes, but whenever you do a read, you're bringing a 64-byte, let's say, block. If you use only eight bytes of it, well, the rest gets wasted, right? You, you brought it into the cache, and you wasted that bandwidth to bring it into the cache. OK, no allocate on a write. It conserves cache space if locality of writes is low, right? If you don't allocate uh, when you're doing a write miss, when, when you have a write miss, this, is, this may be good if you're not going to use that block again, right, for writes or reads at all. So potentially, you get a better cache hit rate. Yes? Yeah. So basically, uh, the question is, I don't know how to throw this over there so that you can ask the question, but the question is, if you, uh, why do we care uh, if we bring the whole block into the cache? It'll take the same amount of time. Well, I will, uh, the, the answer lies in your sec what you said second. It, it actually doesn't take the same amount of time. Because uh, you may have a 64-byte cache block, but your bus might be 64 bits. So it may take actually eight cycles to transfer the cache block. So that's exactly the reason. And we will talk about that when we talk about uh, sub-blocking. OK. So a little bit more about the writes. What if the processor writes to an entire block over a small amount of time? Uh, is there any need to bring the block into the cache from the memory in the first place? Ditto for a portion of the block. So we'll call it, we'll call it a sub-block. So let's assume that a sub-block has four bytes out of 64 bytes. Uh, so if you actually have uh, a, a, if, OK, let's, let's talk about sub-blocks, actually, over here. So one, one uh, sector caches were developed uh, for this purpose. Basically, uh, assuming that you have 64 bytes, and you're going to write to it all. Right? You don't even need to bring that block into the cache at all, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> because let's say you have, uh, you're writing four bytes at a time. You write to this four byte chunk, that's good, that's done. You don't care about the old value. You write to the next four byte chunk, you don't care about the old value over there. So if you keep doing that, you need to have a way of enabling not bringing that cache block into the cache. And the idea of su uh, uh, sub block caches were developed for this purpose. Basically, a sub block cache or sectored cache, both are interchangeable. Uh, the idea is to divide a block into sub-blocks or sectors and have separate valid and dirty bits for each sector, assuming this is a write-back cache. So you have a single tag. That's the tag of the entire block, 64 bytes. But each sub-block, let's say 4 bytes or 8 bytes, has a valid and dirty bit associated with it. So it can have, I don't know, one sub-block valid and everything else invalid over here. So if you're writing to, let's say, an entire sub-block, you just write to it and make it valid and make it dirty. That's it. You don't need to bring anything from main memory because you're updating that block. Does that make sense? So this is useful in that case, for example. Yes? Absolutely, yeah. This could also be used for reading. That's one of the other bullets that I, that, that's coming. So the big upside is there's no need to transfer the entire cache block into the cache in this case. Uh, in fact, you can just transfer only the sub-block, as you said, when you're reading. Uh, but uh, this was developed in the context of writes, especially useful in that case. A write simply validates and updates a sub-block in this case. Uh, and you have more freedom in transferring sub-blocks into the cache. A cache block does not need to be in the cache fully in this case. Right? For example, if on a read, you can say, I want to transfer sub-blocks 5, 0, and 3. Because I have a predictor that says I'm going to use these sub-blocks in a block. 
people actually propose ideas like that because sometimes you don't use all of the cache block, uh, the, ent the cache block in its entirety, but you use bits and pieces of it. Think about a data structure, right? A data structure that has hot parts. It may occupy a 64 byte block, but the hot parts may be only the first two bytes or the first two pointers. We'll talk about that later on. Okay, how many sub blocks do you transfer on a read, for example? That's exactly what I was talking about right now. The downside is, of course, more complex design now, right? Now you have, instead of a single valid bit, you have, uh, I don't know, 16 valid bits and 16 dirty bits, assuming your sub block is four bytes. Right? And it, we may not exp uh, exploit spatial locality fully when used for reads. Basically, also for writes, actually. If you just, if you don't bring the cache block, full cache block into the cache, you're making a prediction, right? If your prediction is wrong, meaning if you're really going to use those sub-blocks that you didn't bring, then you're not exploiting the spatial locality very well. So it's all about that prediction in the end. Uh, I, I sh yeah, say it again. But you, you transferred them early. So the difference is. So, in terms of the transfer latency, yes. But uh, you, you, will, you will lose, uh, uh, basically, you will lose on the hit rate. Right? For example, if you, at, at, time, at time zero, you fetch the entire block, now you, at time 1,000, you're going to hit on it. You, you paid the cost of transferring at that t point. But if you actually didn't fill the block and you're going to hit on it later, you're going to wait at that point in time, right? So you, you, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Be exactly. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Okay, maybe this is a good place to uh, stop and take a break for five minutes, right? <laughs> and then we can continue. All right, I guess we've had a lot of margin. That was a seven minute break rather than five minutes. <laughs> Do you guys like the five minute breaks or seven minute breaks? Or do you want more? More? Okay. <laughs> okay, next time we'll plan better. <laughs> so that's good, there are a lot of questions in this lecture. I mean, this is, uh, this hopefully gives you a good idea of the different trade-offs that you can make. It's a, hu it's a huge design space, as you can see, and we'll do more of this. And we're just looking at caches right now, right? It's actually a huge design space all over the system. That's exactly why we can actually spend two semesters on caches only. But who wants to do that? No, no one wants to do that. So, <laughs> so let's cover it. We, we'll get back to the caches uh, later on again. But let's talk about some more trade-offs. In fact, I think I have 120 slides and we're at 30 so far. We don't need to cover it all, don't worry. <laughs> but this tells you how much richness there is in the design space. So instruction versus data, that's another design choice. Should these be separate? Should these be unified? If you have it unified, this is actually always a choice. Different things, do you want to put them together in the cache or do you want to have separate caches for them? Instructions and data happen to be one dimension of that. Another dimension could be this core's data versus that core's data. This thread data versus that thread data. Systems data versus user's data. Right? All of these could be different things, or stack data versus heap data. Let's look at the instruction versus data. Unified means whenever you are unifying different data types in the cache, you're dynamically sharing the ca available cache space, which means that uh, you, you're not, uh, if you statically partition, if you separate them, you're statically partitioning the space. As a result, you may actually over-provision if you statically partition. If you split the instruction and data, and for example, instructions, do not use the cache that is dedicated to them, whereas data needs more. Split is not good because you've split them. Whereas if it's dynamic, you can fully utilize the cache, right? If instructions don't need that much cache space, data can use it. 
vice versa also. If data doesn't need that much cache space, instruction can use it. That's always the benefit of dynamic sharing. You get more efficient resource utilization, hopefully. But whenever you dynamically share, whenever you are unified, you also have the quality of service problem. If your instructions and data can kick, kick each other out of the cache, because there is no guaranteed space for each other, right? You're not part, you've not partitioned it. You've not separated it. And actually, the reason uh, that most processors don't unify instructions and data at the first level is this one. Instructions and data are accessed in different places in the pipeline. Instructions are needed at the fetch stage. Data is needed at the data access stage. And if you unify the cache, where do you place that for fast access? Remember, L1 caches, the first level caches, the design choices are almost always dictated by the pipeline design, because they're tightly integrated into the pipeline. The purpose of an L1 instruction cache is to feed instructions quickly into the pipeline. The purpose of an L1 data cache is to feed instructions quickly into the pipeline. So it makes no sense to unify those two things that happen to be in separate parts in the pipeline. So that's exactly why first-level caches are almost always split, for, mainly for the last reason about The others are also important, but they're inconsequential for the first-level caches. Of course, we have the same choice for the second-level cache now, right? Do you have a second-level instruction cache and second-level data cache or a second-level unified cache? So you have more space to play with in the next level, second-level, third-level, fourth-level, dot, 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 whereas the first-level, you're really bound by how fast you can supply instructions or data into the uh, first level cache. That's why a lot of the replacement policies uh, can be more fancy for the later level caches, far away from the pipeline. Whereas close to the pipeline, you want to make decisions quickly. OK, and today, second and higher levels are almost always unified, because you don't want to, you don't want to get into the static partitioning. And we will talk about static versus dynamic partitioning later on in the context of multi-core. If you have multiple cores accessing uh, the cache, do you want to have a shared cache, unified cache, or do you want to have statically partitioned cache? Same problem exists over there. OK. So first level caches, uh, since we're on the topic, decisions are very much affected by cycle time, uh, pipeline. Uh, small, as a result, they're small, and they have lower associativity. And tag store and data store access in parallel so that you can get the decision quickly. Right? Do you have a cache hit, cache miss? If you have a cache hit, quickly get the data. Second level caches, on the other hand, they're bigger, first of all. But decisions need to balance hit rate and access latency. Access latency is still important over there, but it, you don't need to be one cycle or two cycles or three cycles. right? So they're usually large and highly associative. Latency is not as important. It's still important, but not as important as this one. So what they usually do is uh, they access the tag store and the data store serially. So they access the tag store first. And then if there's a hit, they access the data store. Now this saves energy, right? If you access the tag store and data store in parallel at the same time, you bring all of the data down, you bring the tags down, and you match the tags, and you figure out there is a cache miss. You brought all the data, moved all the data in the cache, so you wasted a lot of energy. So it's not to waste energy, uh, you have the serial tag versus data access. It didn't used to be that way, but as energy became much more premium in the designs. Designs became much more energy constrained. People started doing these serial tag and data store access. So almost all uh, second level and higher caches in all modern processors are accessed serially this way. Of course, whenever you're thinking of this, uh, oh, this, uh, if you have a tag, a serial tag store versus data store access, you're increasing the latency, right? And you're absolutely right, you're increasing the latency. It's a trade-off between latency and energy. But you can also think about, oh, uh, maybe I can do better than this. Maybe I can predict whether I'm going to hit in the cache, and based on that prediction, I can access the data store, right? If I predict that I'm going to hit in the cache, I access tags and data store serially. If I predict I'm going to miss, I'm go I access them. Uh, sorry, if I predict I'm going to hit, I access them in parallel at the same time. If I predict I'm going to miss, I access the tag store first. And only if I hit, I access the data store. So you can always use prediction to have better mechanisms. But this is serial versus parallel access of tag and data store is one design choice. But you also have a design choice, serial versus parallel access of levels, right? You have the L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache. Nobody said they should be serially accessed. You're the architect. You can decide, oh, I want to start the second level cache access only if first level misses. That's serial. Uh, or 
I start the second level access. At the time, I start the first level access. This way, if I miss in the first level, at least I've done some progress in the access of the second level, right? Or you can be more intelligent. You can say, if I'm going to miss, I start the access in parallel, right? So you can be, you can predict again. Uh, okay. So if, if you do, if you do a serial access, uh, second level does not see the same accesses as the first one. This is also called a filtering effect, right? Basically, first level acts as a filter. It filters some temporal and spatial locality. That cache sees all of the accesses coming from the processor, but the next level of cache sees only the accesses that are coming out of the first level cache. And the next level sees only the accesses that are coming out of the next, this level of cache, right? So your accesses get filtered as you get closer to main memory. You don't see the full access stream of the processor. Which means that your decisions in caching should probably be different also in these different levels of caches. And that's exactly what people have realized. L1 cache is very different from L2 cache, not only because of oh, this reason that I said over here, but also because the access locality is different in terms of the access stream. You may have very good spatial locality in the first access stream, uh, in the first level cache, but then you may not have any spatial locality in the second level cache. Right? It depends, again. It depends on your access pattern. So management policies are therefore different. OK, let's talk uh, more about cache performance. We've been talking about cache performance, but let's look at the parameters uh, a little bit. I think I've given you a big chunk of the design space. There's more, which we will cover. But let's look at the effect of parameters a little bit more concretely. Uh, and these are some parameters. Uh, and we're going to look at it in terms of miss and hit rate, but always think in the back of your mind, this is not necessarily correlated perfectly with performance. What happens to latency also? And we're going to get back to the latency uh, later on, or, or the, uh, the cost of a cache miss later on. So cache size is, of course, one of the important parameters. How do you choose the cache size? Uh, I'm not going to give you the answer, because it's a tough, tough problem also. Uh, and also, again, you may choose the cache size based on your workloads today, but remember, you're running workloads five years into the future, right, when you're designing a system, usually. Uh, OK, so cache size is the total data capacity. Usually, it's expressed in terms of just the data store capacity, not the tag store capacity. So when we say one megabyte cache, tag store has some additional capacity that's not included in that one megabyte. Right? Uh, of course, bigger can exploit temporal locality better, but not always better. Right? So this is one classic example of cache size versus hit rate. As cache size increases, hit rate increases, but at some point, it tapers off again. Again, not always. right? It may be a step function also. Uh, but uh, usually, where the hit rate tapers off is called working set size. Working set, let's go back here. The whole set of data, the executing ap application references within a time interval. I've defined this earlier, but that's essentially what a working set is. But there's a trade off. Uh, if you have a too large of a cache, uh, the downside is you affect the hit and miss latency. You'll, you'll get higher hit rate. At some point, it may taper off or you may have a different function to get the higher hit rate. But if you have some sort of locality in the program, you'll have higher hit rate. Right? Now, if you, you can think about, what if you're always doing random access? Your hit rate is always zero, right? If everything is random. Then that's the, that's the part where your cache size doesn't matter. Uh, but in, in most workloads, this is the curve that you get, or some sort of curve like this. If you have too large of a cache, this adversely affects your hit and miss latency. Smaller is faster, bigger is slower. We've said that before. And access time may degrade the critical path. If you have too small of a cache, you don't exploit temporal locality well, and you, use, uh, you replace useful data often. So hopefully this is obvious. Block size, which we briefly talked about earlier, this is the data that is, uh, si uh, this is the size of the data that is associated with an address tag, <laughs> basically how big your block is. Is it 64 bytes, 8 bytes, 1 byte? One kilobytes. Usually it's uniform in uh, hardware caches, but as you mentioned, maybe there is benefit from having non uniform block sizes. Sub blocking tries to achieve part of that, but it doesn't achieve it fully. Uh, because with this definition, sub blocking really doesn't affect the block size, right? It's really a sub block because your tag determines whether you have stored a block over there. In a sub block cache, you may allocate a smaller sub block. But you're really wasting space for all of the other subblocks over there because you have only a single tag associated with it. Okay, 
so this is not necessarily the unit of transfer between cache hierarchies. Sub-blocking a block is divided into multiple pieces, each with its own valid bit, as we said, and that's the unit of transfer. But unit of transfer actually can be even smaller than sub-blocks, right? The unit of transfer can be one bit, and you transfer after four bytes. Uh, four bytes is 32 bits. After 32 cycles, you get all of the 32 bits, and then you make the sub-block valid. Right. So unit of transfer has nothing to do with the block size. Okay, let's look at the block size, and it's, uh, we've discussed that. So if you have two small blocks, so this is assuming a fixed size cache. The cache size is fixed. If you vary the block size, this is what you get in hit rate. <laughs> Again, a typical application. This is not all applications, clearly. So if you have two small blocks, you don't exploit spatial locality well. That's why your hit rate is relatively low. And you also have larger tag overhead, right? If your block size is small, you need to in, have, more t uh, have a bigger tag to uh, address it. If you have two large blocks, now you have a much smaller number of blocks in the cache. And you're not exploiting temporal locality well. Maybe you're exploiting spatial locality really, really well in those blocks, but not the temporal locality well across the many blocks that you may need. So if you have a one megabyte cache and your block size is one megabytes, you have a huge one megabyte block. But if you're accessing some other byte outside that one megabyte, too bad it's not in your cache. And basically, you waste cache space, bandwidth, and energy if spatial locality is not high, right? So you bring that entire one megabyte block. OK, that's the trade off. So, large blocks, uh, people wanted large blocks because if, if, if you have spatial locality. Uh, but one of the issues with large blocks is they can take a long time to fill into the cache, right? If you have a 64 byte block and your bus is eight bytes, it takes eight cycles to fill the cache. That might be important, right? So what a lot of processors today do is, especially in the memory level, memory level that eight cycles is actually very long. It's not eight processor cycles, it's eight memory cycles. Uh, so what many processors do is they fill the cache lines as critical word first. Critical word meaning that's the word that's required by the load instruction at that moment. Load instruction, at least most load instructions don't require the entire block, they require a word out of that block, right? So you know that word. And you can actually convey that down into the memory hierarchy, and the memory hierarchy prioritizes that critical word first, and then sends the remem uh, remaining parts of the cache block. OK? And that way, you can actually uh, uh, continue that load instruction execution, even though that entire cache block may not be in the cache. The data that you need is back. The cache block is not fully filled, but the load can execute. Right. That's the idea of critical word first. Of course, this increases complexity in the system, right? Because you need to convey which word is more important in the cache downstream into memory hierarchy, some number of bits. 64 bytes, if you have four byte words, that's 16 words that you may have in a cache block. That's four bits down. What is worse is if you have multiple outstanding cache misses to the same cache block, which one is more critical? Right? If you have two cache misses to the same cache block, uh, two, two load instructions that require the same cache block, and the cache block is not in the cache, and they may be accessing different words. Well, you may prioritize a critical word, but that may not buy you much, because you're going to wait for this other load anyway. Right? So that's memory level parallelism again. OK, large cache blocks, on top of this, they waste bus bandwidth, can waste bus bandwidth. So again, sub-blocking can help over here. If you have a sub-block cache, you don't need to bring the entire large cache block. You may still have a large cache block, but you may decide which parts of it to bring. So sub-blocking gives you some more flexibility uh, in, in dealing with large cache blocks. OK. So when is this useful? We've discussed this before. So associativity, actually, we've talked about this, right? Uh, how many blocks can be present in the same index? If you have larger associativity, you have lower miss rate but higher hit latency and area cost, as we've discussed before, even in the beginning of this lecture. If you have smaller associativity, you have lower cost and lower hit latency. But, uh, of course, you may have a lower miss rate also. Okay, one question that we actually had in our digital circuits exam is, is power of two associativity required? And you guys should say no to this one. <laughs> because there's no reason your associativity needs to be a power of two, right? You're not indexing into the cache. The associativity, if you think about it, uh, is how many blocks can map, uh, can be present in the same index. You can make, it, make that arbitrary. You can make that 311. 
It's really tag matches that determine which one matches. Right? It's really associative memory. You're not indexing into it, so you're not using part of the address to index into it. You're just matching part of the address, and that requires comparators. So you can have three-way associative cache, for example. <laughs> you just need three comparators to compare three tags and decide which one matches. OK, let's classify the cache miss a little bit. This is usually how cache misses are classified, compulsory, capacity, conflict. Compulsory is basically, it's, a, it's the first reference to an address that always results in a miss. Right? It's not in the cache. And subsequent references should hit unless the cache block is displaced for one of the reasons below. <laughs> so the first reference is always a compulsory miss. The next reference to that same cache block you've already taken a compulsory miss on is either a capacity miss or a conflict miss. If your cache was large enough, you should have cached it. Right? OK, this is obvious, hopefully, right? compulsory. You cannot cache something you have not seen before, basically, if all you're doing is caching, of course. So capacity miss, uh, cache is too small to hold everything needed, basically. And it's defined, really, uh, in relation to this conflict miss, basically. Uh, it's defined as the misses that would occur even in a fully associative cache with optimal replacement policy of the same capacity. <laughs> Which makes sense. <laughs> and conflict miss, this is just to think about the misses. There, there's no uh, perfect way of defining this, I think, because what is optimal replacement? Again, we go back to that, right, if, uh, if we define it this way. But you can think of it that way. If you, if you have a fully associative cache, and if you're still getting misses, you either need bigger cache or better replacement policy in that case. OK, conflict miss is defined as any miss that is neither compulsory nor a capacity miss, as you can see. <laughs> OK. So how to reduce each mistype? So the mistypes are interesting because it can give you a, a framework of how to reduce them. Compulsory misses, can you reduce these with caching? No, right? You say, no, caching cannot help, but other things may. If you prefetch, for example, if you anticipate that you're going to access this block out of the blue, you can bring it into your cache, and by the time you access it for the first time, it's in your cache. That's nice. And we're going to talk about that, prefetching mechanism. Modern processors employ very, very, well, reasonably sophisticated prefetching mechanisms, because memory latency is a big problem and they, caching is not enough. So conflict misses, more associativity, of course, will help, or other ways to get more associativity without making the cache more associative, because associativity comes at a cost. And we're going to talk about some of these. Capacity, well, if you get capacity misses, maybe you can utilize the cache space better, right? Keep blocks that will be referenced. Uh, or you can do better software management. You divide your working set such that each phase into, fits into the cache, right? That way, you don't require more capacity. You basically tweak the software such that you don't require more capacity at a given time. OK. So we're going to talk about how to improve cache performance. There are usually three fundamental goals. You want to reduce the miss rate. Uh, that's one way of improving performance. But it may come at the cost of something else. You can reduce the miss latency or miss cost. Again, that's another way of improving performance. It may come at a cost of something else. You can reduce the hit latency or hit cost. It may come at the cost of something else, right? So when I talk about cost, uh, latency, latency is basically how long it takes a service to miss. Cost is not necessarily the same as latency, right? Cost means, and when I talk about cost over here, miss cost, it's really how long does this miss stall the processor? It's not necessarily the latency it takes the service to miss. And these are two different things. Latency takes the service to miss maybe a million cycles. But all of that might be hidden because you're waiting for some other cache miss that takes 2 million cycles. Right? So the cost of that miss may be very little, actually. Or latency takes to service maybe 100 cycles. And this is the only thing that you're waiting for at that point in time. So your cost is also 100 cycles. You're stalling the processor for the duration of that latency. OK, so reducing miss rate, as we've said, reducing miss rate can reduce performance if more costly to refetch blocks are evicted. And you can actually make statements about all of these over here, reducing hit latency. This is actually the harder part, reducing hit latency. How do you reduce hit latency while keeping the same miss rate or hit rate in the cache? We're not going to talk a lot about this one, actually, because there is not a huge optimization space over here. But there's a huge optimization space uh, for these two over here. But they're both three together affect performance. Hopefully, that should be clear. You know the boring hierarchical latency equation that I've shown you in the previous lecture? Uh, the hierarchical latency analysis of cache misses. If you remember, if you don't remember, take a look at the lecture. 
but that gives you the late, overall latency that's exposed to the uh, processor. But again, that doesn't take into account the cost over there. So ke always keep that in mind. OK, so we're going to look at some techniques to improve the basic cache performance. Reducing miss rate uh, will be the first focus, but we're going to talk about reducing miss latency and cost as well. So let's talk about uh, reducing miss rate. We talked about more associativity, of course, that's one way of uh, reducing miss rate. Uh, having more levels, such that each level has a reduced miss rate, is another one. Those are obvious stuff. But we're going to talk about cheaper ways of doing things. Because an engineer is someone who can do for a dime what every fool can do for a dollar, right? <laughs> That's what engineering is about. And we're going to talk about engineering better ways, perhaps. And these approaches are used in some variety of processors over time. So let's see. So people have. People wanted to have more associativity, but instead of building highly associative caches, they wanted to be more frugal. And they proposed several mechanisms. Let's talk about the first one. The first one is actually a beautiful paper that not only talks about victim caches, but also talks about prefetching, stream prefetching. And uh, Norm Juppie is the author. He happens to be also the first author of Google's TPU in 2017. So you can see that an architect actually spends <laughs> doing a lot of different things over their lifetime, right? So he proposed, for this paper, actually, he got the Test of Time Award in ISCA in 2005, I think, yeah. Yeah, exactly, in 2005, because ISCA gives a Test of Time Award after 15 years, if I remember correctly. And this was published in 1990. And people, uh, processors have actually employed uh, victim caches over time. So the basic idea is very simple. Associativity is complex. So we want a direct map cache, fast to access, right? We have a lot of benefits. You know the benefits very well by now. But now with direct map cache has this conflict. So why not add a small victim cache that keeps the recently evicted blocks and make the victim cache reasonably associative, let's say fully associative, as proposed in this paper. That's the idea. Use a small fully associative buffer, victim cache, to store recently evicted blocks. And it turns out this is pretty effective. And this targets the uh, bad access patterns, right? If you're accessing A and B, and they happen to map to the same index, A, B, 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 direct map cache can store only one, and the victim cache will store the other one. Now you can get the performance of, hopefully, an associative cache, almost. That's the idea. So this can avoid ping-ponging of cache blocks, just like I said, if two cache blocks consistently access a nearby time conflict with each other. And not only two, maybe, if this is fully associative, Maybe you have A, B, C, D, E. They all map to the same cache block. A is stored here, B, C, D, E are stored there, right? Now, of course, you're limited by the size of your victim cache in terms of how much you can tolerate the conflict misses. So it's a pretty clever idea. Uh, there are downsides, of course, add more complexity, right? Uh, that's one downside. Uh, the other downside is it depends. Again, you have a choice over here. Do you access this victim cache in parallel with the direct map cache or serially with the direct map cache, right? If you access it in parallel, uh, that may be good, depends on how, how, how often you hit over here. If you access it serially, you increase the miss latency, right? It's, it's like a, another level, right? If you access it in serially with the, uh, this cache, do you access it in parallel with the next level cache? So you have some more design choices. And they all affect your performance. But this is an idea that actually works, and people have employed this idea. A lot of HP processors actually employed this idea. And they may be employing this idea without telling it. It's such an old idea at the moment that it's, it's a way of actually getting more associativity without paying a lot for it. Makes sense, right? OK. But I like the story about the first author uh, being the first author of the Google's TPU. So if you're a good architect, you will actually architect anything <laughs> in the end. <laughs> it's all about the principles again, right? OK, so the second one. Uh, Second technique to get better uh, performance, better hit rate, without adding more associativity. And the idea over here is, remember when we talked about indexing the cache, you take some bits of the address to index the cache, right? Instead of taking those bits directly, why don't we have a hash function to randomize those bits? This way you can get rid of the bad conflicts. A and A, B, A, B. Uh, if you take just address bits, they may map to the same block, say the same index. But if you actually hash, have a hash function that determines your index based on the address, they may actually map to different parts of the cache, different indexes in the cache. That's the idea. Use a better randomizing index function, a hash function, basically. Makes sense, right? 
So this can reduce the conflict misses by distributing the access memory blocks more evenly across the sets. sets. And this can actually get rid of those pathological access patterns that you have AB, 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 AB mapping to the same location because you're better distributing the accesses. And it turns out this is in practice, it works that way. Uh, okay, uh, so what is an example of conflict magnets? So you have a striated access pattern where strider value equals number of sets in the cache. So this is how I like to think about that. So you have, let's say, 512 sets in the cache. Let's say it's direct mapped, and your stride is 512. So you're accessing address A, address A plus 512, block address, A plus 1,024, A plus uh, 1,536, dot, dot, dot. You're, you may have 512 sets in the cache, but you're really using only one set. Everything is mapping to that one set. Sounds terrible, right? Because you're really using those address bits directly. If you hash them, and if you have a good hash function, you'd be utilizing your cache capacity, the sets, much more. That's the idea. Of course, the downside, as with every idea, it's more complex to implement, right? It can lengthen the critical path. Depends on your hash function in the end. If your hash function is simply an XOR with some bits, it still adds some latency, of course. But maybe it's not that bad. If your hash function is a really complicated Galois field comp computation with a matrix, now it may be expensive, right? OK. Hashing. So hashing is nice. Whenever you have conflicts, good hash, you, need, you need good hash functions to, f to resolve them. So another idea is what's called pseudo-associativity, or poor man's associative cache. <laughs> so if you don't have a hardware cost to build an associative cache and look up multiple tags in parallel, if you're a poor man, what would you do? Well, you look up serially instead of in parallel. Right, that's the idea. <laughs> you look up uh, whether a cache block is inside the set, and then if you miss, you use a different index function and access the cache again. Basically, rehash. It's, it's kind of like a hash table. You're thinking of, ca uh, I'm thinking of cache as a hash table right now, almost. Each location can contain multiple elements. If you don't find, let's say in this case, each location contains only one element that's direct mapped. If you don't find the thing you're looking for in this location, you generate a new index function and look for it in the next location. If you don't find it over there, you generate a new index function and you look for it in this next other location. So you have n possible locations a block may reside at. At any given point, it will reside at only one possible location. But to get to that location, you do a serial lookup. You start with some index. If it's not there, you use the next index function. If it's not there, use the next index function. If it's not there, use the next index function. And you can actually keep doing it almost forever. <laughs> of course, you don't want to do it more than the number of sets you have in the cache. But even that may be too much. But that's exactly why, how you can get more associativity, right? Instead of having associativity in space, well, it's still associativity in space, but you actually look it up in time. Uh, you, you don't look it up at the same time. You look it up serially. So this is one hash function. I'm not going to go through this, basically. But you implement k divided by n sets. And every time you look, at, you look up a different portion of the address. And if you do the calculation, you will see that. But this doesn't have to be uh, the, uh, the different functions. You can think of a different function uh, mapping to the different uh, nth access uh, that you're doing into the cache. Makes sense, right? You basically look up the location serially. Of course, the upside is less complex than n-way because you don't look up uh, the different possible locations for a block in parallel. But now you have longer cache hit, may miss, uh, hit or miss latency, or both, actually, right? because you need to look up n times. Uh, of course, uh, it's not longer if you hit the first time. right? <laughs> for the first access, you don't change the access latency at all. That's one of the benefits of this compared to a uh, truly associative cache, not a poor man's associative cache. The first access uh, is to a cache block. Let's say it's direct mapped. Uh, you don't change the access latency of that at all. But the next one, you need to uh, incur the first access latency uh, before the, you can actually find the uh, next one. OK, so let's, oh, hopefully people have understood the, these, right? That's good. Shout if it's, if it's not good. Nobody's shouting yet, or people are tired. <laughs> so all of these techniques have been implemented at some point in architecture. But uh, more recent architectures have gone into things like this, basically. 
so one idea that's relatively simple in hindsight is having different hash functions, different index functions for different ways in the cache. So basically, now we're actually dissecting the ways. Instead of having a single index function for a, single, for a given set, this way, way 0, let's say you have a two-way associative cache, way 0, way 1, you have different index functions, such that different things map to different parts, and you, have these, you eliminate those pathological access patterns. If A, B, C happen to be mapped to the same location, maybe you can distribute them better. That's the idea over here. So this is a pictorial depiction of this. This is what we normally do, right? These are, this is a set, essentially, way 0 and way 1 together. And normally, we have this index function, and we use the same index function. Pathological access pattern I've already given you. Right. Instead of this, have something like this. <laughs> have a function 0 over here, a hashing function, and maybe have another function over here. Right. In this case, you can use the same index, direct index directly, for example. And if you increase this, you have different hashing functions for different ways. This way, your access pattern now gets distributed, assuming you start with an associative cache. Right. It's very similar to direct map cache using a hash function in that direct map cache. But now you have an associative cache. You have different hash functions to index the different ways. You have a question? Yes. I suppose those Pathological, yeah. Well, way, you mean ways or sets? So, for example, every eighth element is going to the same set. That's right, yeah. So, index, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we're always talking about this in parallel two. That's right. Huh? But probably the software level is also a bit such a mm -hmm. different pattern, except in parallel two. So, so I'll, I'll take issue with the second one. It may happen in powers of two, but your straight might be three also, right? But OK, uh, you're, I think what you're saying is, why don't we have a non-power of two number of sets, yeah. right, index? Yeah, now you need to have a mapping of your address to that. That's a little bit more complicated. Because now you need to have, take an address and index a non-power of two location. <laughs> it's possible, but it comes at complexity, additional complexity. That's the, that's the main reason. But I think you have a good idea. <laughs> Strides of that number. Sure, sure, that's right. But the probability of that is hopefully lower. That's what uh, he's saying. He's saying probably the probability of a power of two stride is higher. My favorite example is having um, mm, having a prime number of sets. Right. If you have a prime number of sets, then <laughs> it's likely that you're not going to have a stride that bad. It's possible, but the likelihood becomes lower. The conflict likelihood. But it's very. Uh, it's it's usually harder to design that one because. Here, you're, you're nice, right? Because it's, it's really binary, and you just index directly. There, your indexing function becomes complicated. And people have actually proposed this. There's a paper in 16 years ago, actually 15, uh, 13 years ago in HPCA 2004 that talks about having a prime number sets and indexing and talk about all of the difficulties of doing it and the benefits. So in the end, they get some benefit, but probably the uh, difficulty of designing it becomes worse. But I like your thinking. That's good. <laughs> OK, so uh, I, ho I hope everybody got this idea. This way, you can distribute the uh, uh, conflicts differently to different ways. As a result, you get less conflicts, hopefully. OK, so the, the idea is reduce. Uh, let me go over it again. You use different index functions for each cache way, and this is the paper that described it. Uh, the benefit is indices are more randomized. Memory blocks are better distributed across sets. It's less likely that two blocks have the same index, especially with striped accesses meaning reduced conflict misses. The cost is additional latency of a hash function, or multiple hash functions, depending on your associativity. OK, let's talk about software. I mean, we could talk, keep going on the hardware, but let's talk about some software approaches for higher hit rate also. Uh, given a cache, if you're aware of the cache, you can restructure your data access patterns and data layout, and you can do other optimizations, potentially. Let's take a look at them. Uh, so the first idea is you can restructure your data layout or access patterns. And these are really two sides of the same coin. You can do either one to better utilize your cache. I'll give you one example. Uh, let's say you have a column major matrix. 
Do you guys know what a column major is? Consecutive columns are st stored in consecutive memory locations. That's what column major is. Well, that's what uh, basically xi plus 1 comma j follows xi comma j in memory. <laughs> Uh, whereas xi comma j plus 1 is far away from xij. That's what it is. So if you have a, a poor code looks like this in that case. Uh, what are you trying to do over here? Basically, you, you're iterating over the columns and then the rows. Right? You're basically touching the first column and the next column and the next column, dot, dot, dot. But, if you, but this is a better code if you want to exploit locality. Make sense? Because now you're... Uh, while your row is in the cache, <laughs> you exploit that. But, sorry, while your column is in the cache, you iterate over the rows, such that you basically bring the, hopefully the entire column or part of the column, and then you exploit locality over there, and then uh, go to the next column, and then go to the next column, and then go to the next column. Make sense? So if you're column uh, major, uh, you want to basically exploit the fact that that column is consecutive in memory, and hopefully part of it is in your cache, which means that you need to iterate over the rows to, uh, such that you exploit that column locality. If you do that, then your miss rate will be very high. Right. That's the idea. Okay, this is called loop interchange. Basically, you're interchanging the inner loop with the outer loop, right? If, you, if actually a compiler, for example, figures out that somebody wrote this code this way, they can go back and <laughs> reorganize the code, assuming they can do it safely. Right. So other optimizations can also increase hit rate. For example, you can fuse loops. You can ar merge arrays that are referenced together. We're not going to go into the detail. If you are taking a compiler's course, you'll see some of that, because compiler is all about exploiting cache locality also. Uh, a, go a good chunk of compiler optimizations are there for exploiting cache locality. How many of you have taken compiler cor a compiler course before? Anybody? One? Oh, just one. Okay. That's not required, I assume, right? Okay. Well, if, you, if you decide to take another course, compiler course is a nice course, I think, in general. <laughs> because you get to learn how the software takes advantage of the underlying hardware, in this case. Okay. Okay, is this clear? If it's not clear, you can draw the picture uh, uh, yourself. Or, of course, this depends on your data layout, right? If, this is, if, if, if your matrix is stored as column major, this is better code. If your matrix is stored as row major, then this is the better code, right? <laughs> because that row is uh, different columns of the row are consecutive in memory, so you really want to go through all of the columns of a row before going to the next row. Okay. Of course, the difficulties are, what if you have multiple arrays? Things are not as nice in the world like this. So if you have actually 10 different arrays and different orders, and if you're traversing things in different orders, what do you do? If you don't know the array size at compile time, all of these actually complicate uh, getting the best out of the cache at compile time or at software writing time. Another uh, idea at the software level is blocking. Some of you may have heard it. Uh, this is very commonly used. Uh, basically, the idea is to divide uh, the loops operating on arrays into computation chunks such that each chunk can hold its data into the cache. The entire loop, if you may be operating on a huge data set, and if you do the loop on that entire data set, you may get 0% cache hit rate. But if you actually divide the loop such that you operate on a small data set, and then do the next data set next, the same loop, and then the next data set next, the next data set next, if you partition your data set such that you operate on a data set size that fits into your cache, then you can actually get a much better hit rate. That's the idea of blocking, basically. You block your code, or you block your data and code at the same time to get that. So this avoids cache conflicts between different chunks of computation, or different chunks of data that access the different, uh, 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 that, are, that are accessed at the same time. Essentially, what you're doing is you divide, you're dividing the working set such that each p piece fits in the cache. And of course, this is done more easily if your access patterns are regular, right? If you have a matrix, for example, instead of operating on the matrix that, has, uh, that is 1 million by 1 million, which may be bigger than your cache, you first operate on 1,000 by 1,000, and then the next 1,000 by 1,000, and then the next 1,000 by 1,000, dot, 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 right? That's the idea. 
But if your data structure is not something that you can reason about that easily, this may be more difficult. And also, there may be self conflicts in a block. There can be conflicts among different arrays. And the array size may be unknown at compile or programming time. This, these, all of these make things complicated because if you don't know, that may be difficult. But still, you can get around it if you know your cache size, perhaps. OK, let's look at、uh, restructuring data layout a little bit. I'll, I'll give you another example、uh, here. So, this is one piece of code. We have nodes.、Uh, And basically, this,、uh, we're doing some pointer based traversal of this linked list.、Um, and what's happening over here is we're searching for an input key. And I don't know, whatever key. Key could be your unique ID, right? Your ID number in, at the school. If the key of the node is equal to the key that we're searching for, then we access some other fields in the code,、uh, in the node, get some information. Otherwise, we keep searching in this linked list. This sounds OK, a y right? This code works. But there's a problem with it. What's the problem? If I tell you that it has ca poor cache hit rate, what do you say? Yes? In order to check the key. OK. OK. I see. OK. 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 I, I see what you. So, how, how, which ones would you move over here?、Uh, which ones? Like, which ones would you move to a different data structure? Okay. 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 Yeah. I mean, that's that's one way of doing it, assuming you have sequential patterns.、Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that will solve the problem, but maybe、uh, the the problem. Uh, I, uh, my explanation of the problem will be a little bit different. Let's see if it's the same as yours.、Uh, So, in this case,、uh, I think you're targeting the same problem. These other fields over here, name and school,、uh, are in the cache because you're assuming this is all sequential. They get into the cache, but you're not accessing them frequently. What you're accessing frequently, if you look at this access pattern, you're accessing the node and the key, right? In common case, you should have these in the cache, and only in the uncommon case, you should access these. You should have these in the cache. But the way this thing is written over here, all of that will be in your cache block.、Right? So I think that's what you're getting into also. So basically,、uh, you don't want these to be occupying the cache. Ideally, you would like node and key, 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 all of that in your cache block such that you go to the next one, next one, next one, next one, assuming a sequential access pattern again. If it's totally random, that one, that one will work also. Uh, but basically, if you do this, if you move out, separate the frequently used fields of data,、uh, fields of a data structure, and pack them into a separate data structure like this, you can get much better cache locality. Now, what's in your cache is this, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. That's the idea over here. Make sense? So, the idea basically is to separate out the frequently used. Fields from the not frequently used fields. You don't want frequently used data to be at the same cache line as the infrequently used data. That's why you get worse locality. If you always keep frequently used data in the cache line, like this, node and key are frequently used, then you don't pollute your cache. Of course, you can do better than this, perhaps. You can actually change this into an array and get rid of something like this, right? But you can always play tricks, assuming you, are, you know how your data is laid out. Make sense? You can have an array, for example,、uh, instead of having a linked list over here. And you can assume that、uh, whenever you get a key match in the array, in this other array, you're at the same location, right? That's another way. But anyway, you can optimize the code forever. So, but there's another question, which is who should do this, right? Should the programmer do this? Should the compiler do this? Should the hardware do this? Who can determine what is frequently used? <laughs> So, if the programmer wrote a code like this, can the hardware 
ensure that this part of the cache block, this stuff, this is actually very large if you, if you look at this, 256 bytes, 256 bytes. Uh, you'll bring only a part of it. But the part of the cache block uh, that's not used will not be brought into the cache. Can the hardware do that? That's a bit tough right now, right? Because, yeah, maybe you use sub blocks, right? If you actually know the access pattern, you can only bring some sub blocks. But you're still not utilizing your cache well. You're just not bringing stuff into the cache. You're utilizing your bandwidth better. But you cannot utilize your cache well because these sub blocks are not going to be used, they're going to be empty. Okay. So it's a good idea to always think about who should do this. I think if the programmer can do it, that's the best way. <laughs> if, of course, they're, they understand their program well, and they understand the access patterns well. Uh, compiler can also help the programmer alleviate it. But then compiler always has a problem. How does it know the access patterns? It needs to profile the program somehow. How representative is that profiling with the different input sets? Uh, and should it do dynamic profiling versus static profiling? Dot, 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 right? OK, well, we'll talk about some issues like this as we uh, go over this course. But this is just one example of optimization. OK, I think that's a good place to stop and take, uh, let's say, a seven minute break <laughs> for you guys. I've increased it by two minutes. <laughs> We're still at slide 55. <laughs> I just want to cor cor dynamically correct one thing. There was struct node node over here before, but that should really be next, right? As uh, as you have figured out. <laughs> but if you see that mistake, please shout at me, and I can correct it dynamically. We're all humans; it's not perfect. We should achieve. We should strive for perfection, but we cannot always achieve perfection. <laughs> I hope this is right now, right? It looks right, OK. But hopefully, that's a small mistake that you can understand what's going on. You basically access the next node. OK, let's go to the next uh, aspect of improving basic cache performance. We've looked at ways of reducing miss rate. This is, not by, this is by no means a comprehensive look, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it gives you an idea of what uh, some approaches have been, at least some prevalent approaches. And this doesn't even t talk about how to do it in the multi-core space. Uh, but let's talk, into, talk about how to reduce missed latency or cost. We have actually looked at uh, multiple ways. Multi-level caches actually reduce missed latency, right? If you add another level, hopefully that's faster than the level that was there before. As a result, you reduce the missed latency uh, of the previous level. Critical word first reduces the missed latency uh, for an important word. Sub-blocking, sectoring. They both le can reduce missed latency or cost. But better replacement and insertion policies can also achieve the same effect. And we'll talk about non-blocking caches. You can have multiple axes in parallel and multiple axes per cycle at the same time. And there could be software approaches also, which we're not going to talk about over here. So before that, let's uh, uh, go back and talk a little bit about what is missed latency or missed cost affected by. And remember, missed cost is how long does the miss stall the processor. Missed latency is how long does the miss take to get serviced. Uh, one thing that's, uh, that affects this is where does the miss get serviced from? The other is how much does the miss stall the processor? That's the miss cost. So there are many places where the miss can, can get serviced from, local versus remote memory, this processor's memory versus that processor's memory. Uh, what level of cache in the cache hierarchy? Row hit versus row miss in DRAM. Whether you have queuing delays in the memory control and the interconnect. Even in a single chip today, you have different memory channels, right? This memory channel may be quick because it's not very loaded. This memory channel may be slow because it's very loaded, right, at that point in time. So this may depend on the point in time also, right? And there may be other things that you come up with. How much does the miss stall the processor? That depends uh, usually with, uh, on whether or not it, the miss is overlapped with other latencies, whether or not you have another miss pending. As we discussed, if you actually two misses in parallel, you want to get rid of both of them at the same time to unblock the processor, right? Is the data immediately needed? Again, that uh, maybe the data is not immediately needed. Maybe it's needed for a later instruction, right? That happens to be fetched, that happens to be executed right now. But there is an earlier instruction that's, 
there, there is a sequence of instructions. Because of auto order execution, you may actually execute a later instruction earlier than these instructions. So this data that you uh, need it, uh, that you need, may not be needed immediately because you have all of these other instructions to go through first. And they may be stalling the processor, right? And there may be other things over here. So let's take a look at this notion of memory level parallelism because that's really important in today's systems. Uh, that basically uh, is, deals with the notion of overlapping of missed latencies. So this is a pictorial depiction. This is an isolated miss. This is time over time. Uh, this is an isolated miss that the processor is waiting for. And these two misses, part of their latencies, a good chunk of their latencies are actually overlapped, as you can see. These are called parallel misses. So uh, memory level parallelism is the notion of generating and servicing multiple memory access in parallel. This is a beautiful one-pager paper that defines it, actually. It's going to be referenced later on in this lecture. Uh, and there may be, there have been several techniques to improve memory level parallelism, like auto order execution, right? Auto order execution, for example, you can generate a load miss, and then you can generate another load miss by another instruction. If you, in fact, if your instruction window, how many instructions you can execute at the same time, you can have in the machine at the same time is 128. You can have 128 misses at the same time, of course, as sure, if, you, if you're not limited by some other resource. Uh, so MLP clearly varies. Some misses are isolated and some are parallel. So this miss, for example, is isolated. You're waiting for it, only waiting for that. The processor is waiting for only that. Whereas here, the processor is waiting for both of them. So if you somehow cache this and prioritize the caching of this, you can get rid of the stall time that the processor has for that miss. OK, how does this affect cache replacement? Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Traditional cache replacement policies try to reduce miscount, as we've seen with Velody's Optimal. The implicit assumption is that reducing miscount reduces memory-related stall time, how much this processor stalls for the uh, miss. The uh, issue is the observation in the paper that you're going to read is that misses with varying cost and MLP breaks this assumption. Basically, eliminating an isolated miss helps performance more than eliminating a parallel miss because that's more costly from the processor's perspective, right? A parallel miss is less costly because you've overlapped its latencies with n number of other misses. And eliminating a higher latency miss also could help performance more than eliminating a lower latency miss. It's similar in that sense. So let's, keep, let's look at an example. It's an example from the paper that you're reading, but I like this sort of intuitive examples. Let's assume that you're operating in a loop. That's what this is, <laughs> pictorially. And you can only cache four blocks in your cache. And uh, these are the blocks. It misses the blocks uh, P1, P2, P3, and P4 are serviced in parallel, whereas misses the blocks S1, S2, and S3 are serviced in serial. So they're serial, isolated misses that look like this. So S blocks are isolated misses, P blocks are parallel misses. And all four of them are parallel in this case. P4, P3, P2, P1 are all serviced in parallel. Uh, so let's, we're going to optimize, look at two replacement algorithms, simulate them very quickly. One that minimizes the miscount, this is Beldi's optimal, replace the block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future. And the other one is more MLP aware. I'm not going to tell you how that MLP aware is implemented, but I'm going to tell you that it's going to try to keep in the cache these blocks only. May, uh, uh, not only, but to prioritize these, keeping these blocks in the cache. So let's take a look at for a, fu a fully associative cache containing four blocks. Uh, so it turns out Beldi is opt. Uh, after this, all four blocks will be in the cache. So all four blocks are in the cache and Bellity is optimal uh, uh, replacement in this case. Let's start from there, right? Because Bellity is optimal, remember, you're going to replace the block that's going to be referenced further into the future. So if you're at this point, that block is S3. <laughs> so let's assume you cached S3. You go here, you replace S3 so that you actually cache P4, and then P3, and then P2, P1. And then at this point, you're definitely in your, uh, in your cache have these blocks. OK, these are all hits at the point, at this point, basically. Whenever you access them the next time, you're going to hit uh, on them, which is good. You're trying to minimize the miss rate. So the next block, you actually have a miss to S1. Well, let's, let's, let's look at the state of the cache. P4, P3, P2, P1 are in the cache at the point. At this point, this is the hit-miss indicator. With Beldi's opt replacement, what happens is you miss on this one because it's not in your cache, and you need to replace something. What is that something? The thing that's going to be referenced furthest into the future. What's furthest into the future? Definitely not S1, not S2, not S3. 
well, um, you, you need to look at what's in your cache, of course. Is it going to be P4, P3, P2, or P1? You want to replace P1, right? Because that's going to be referenced furthest into the future, if you, if you know this access pattern magically. So you replace P1 with S1. Similarly, you replace P2. Uh, well, I guess in this case, S1 is going to be the furthest in the future. So you're going to replace S1 at this point. You, you just cache S1. But you're going to replace S1 because that's going to be referenced furthest into the future. P4, P3, and P2 are all going to be referenced earlier, right? So you replace S1 with, uh, replace it with uh, S2. Similarly, at this point in time, you, this is the sta state of the cache. Uh, you want to bring in S3, and you want to replace the block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future, and that happens to be S2 again. So you replace that. You, so you get misses on these things that are serial. OK, fine. At this point, this is what you have in your cache. And P4, P3, P2 all hit in the cache. But P1 misses. And at that point, you go back to the steady state. You'll bring uh, P4, P4, uh, P, you, you bring P1 into the cache, and P, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Hopefully, it makes sense. Because you're going to reference S3 furthest into the future at that point in time. I should have animated that also, actually. You go back to the steady state where you started from at this point in time. So let's do the calculation here. You have four misses, right? One, two, three, four. And you have four different stalls, right? For this block, you're going to stall for this miss. For this block, you're not going to stall. Sorry, this is not very nicely aligned. I should fix this alignment. PowerPoint has all this problem. But basically, you're going to stall for this miss, you're going to stall for this miss, you're going to stall for this miss, and you're going to stall for this miss, right? Four stalls. So this is the best you can do for misses, actually. You can try to do better than number of misses, but you're not going to beat uh, Beldi's opt unless you change the playing field, unless you say you're, we're not going to cache stuff. Right. But let's take a uh, look at this one. Actually, even, the, even then, I'm not sure. Uh, you, you may actually lose, but I didn't do that study, so I'm not going to claim. Let's look at an MLP aware replacement policy. MLP aware replacement means you're going to keep in the cache things that are serial, the blocks that are serial. And by definition, you want to be at this point. You want S1, S2, S3 in your cache at this point. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. That's what the paper reading is about. Maybe we'll get to it. But you just hit on these. And you're not going to replace these things that you know are more costly. How do you know? Well, you figure it out. You've seen it once. You say, oh, this is a block that has been isolated. It didn't happen with other blocks. It didn't happen with other misses. So I'm going to predict that it's going to be isolated again in the future and again into the future. So if you record that, when, when the time of replacement comes, this is the cache state at this point. You're accessing P4. Well, what you do is you don't replace any of these. Right? These are more costly. Keep them in the cache. Less costly stuff, replace P4 with P3, P3 with P2. P2 with P1, and that's the state of the cache that you have at that point in time, at this, after this block of misses. Now you get misses on three of them. You start with P4 over here, that's a hit, but all of the other three are misses. Right. At this point, again, you start with P1, that's a hit, but all of the three, P2, P3, P4, are misses, because you don't want to replace these costly blocks. Right. Costly meaning the processor stalls for that block only. Now let's take a look. Here we have six misses, worse than Beldi's optimal. But stalls are only two, or two and a change. Why? Because you can overlap the latency of these three misses at the same time. Whereas you couldn't overlap the latency of these three misses that are serial. As a result, we decided to keep them in the cache. And you save cycles as a result, even though you increase the miss rate. So what really matters in the end to performance is how much you stall the processor, right? Not your miss rate. <laughs> and this is a perfect example, a cooked up example, <laughs> that shows that that is the case. Right? But of course, you should read the paper, and this is a reading for review, that talks about how to do this, right? And actually, this paper shows that in some cases, you may increase the miss rate, but your performance goes down, and vice versa. Your performance goes up when you actually, well, yeah. <laughs> you may reduce miss rate, but your performance, uh, but the other way around. You, you may reduce miss rate, your performance 
uh, actually goes down. And you may actually increase the miss rate, and your performance goes up because you actually can overlap cache misses better. OK. So there are some other recommended cache papers that I have that I am not going to assign you to read because if I assign you to read papers, then you'll be reading papers and doing that only. <laughs> but you can read these <laughs> in your spare time if you're interested. There, there is a bunch of work that has happened over time. Uh, this is one of the nice works, actually, that showed how to do adaptive insertion policies. Whether, how you decide, do you decide, where do you, uh, which priority do you insert the block in? Do you insert it at the LRU position or MRU position, for example? That, that, remember, we discussed that. That determines how quickly the block gets evicted. And this paper is trying to figure out a good balance. So if you're, for example, random access patterns, you may want to insert that block with low priority into the cache. That's one of the ideas over here. But if you're LRU friendly, you may want to insert that block into the highest, best position, top, topmost LRU position. So you can do that dynamically. This is one paper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can take a look at that using Bloom filters. This is more or less the state of the art. There are more works, but. Uh, and then there's also other stuff that we may later talk about. So we have not talked about, for example, compressing data in caches, right? That's one way of increasing the cache utilization. You can potentially compress data in caches. And this, going forward, this may be uh, also in memory as well. This may be an interesting way, but I'm not going to talk about that. Not, not right now, at least. Let's talk about hybrid cache replacement a little bit, selecting between multiple cache replacement policies, because, again, in hardware, in software, this may seem easy. Again, it, it comes at a cost, but in hardware, you need to be really cash, cash, you need to be really hardware conscious when you do this. And this is also proposed in the paper that you're reading, so you're going to read about this. But the problem that this is trying to solve is not a single policy provides the best performance, right, highest performance. For, it, this could be true for a given set. This could be true for the entire cache overall also. So you may want to have different replacement policies for a given set, and different sets may want to have different replacement policies for highest performance, or the entire cache may follow a single policy, but this may change over time. The best one may change over time. And we have many, many different policies. The idea, assuming you have two policies, implement both policies and pick the one that's expected to perform best at runtime. Again, you can do this on a per set basis, or you can do this for the entire cache. If you do this per, on a per set basis, your cost is higher, of course, right? Now you need to keep track of which policy is doing better on a per set basis. And of course, it, it does not have to be both. It can be many, many policies, and among many policies you can choose. Of course, your hardware cost increases as the number of policies increases. So the upside of this is higher performance. The downside of this is higher cost and complexity. And you need a selection mechanism. Let's talk about that selection mechanism. How do you determine which one is performing better? Uh, well, one idea, there may be other ideas over here, and this, this is a potential place for innovation, uh, but one idea that's used in existing systems is you implement multiple tag stores, each following a particular policy, and find the best one and have the main tag store follow that best policy. Of course, this comes at a cost, right? So let's take a look at that. Tag store, uh, I'll give you some terminology. Tag store, this is the terminology of the paper also. Tag store is also called tag directory. That's unfortunate. I, uh, uh, this actually, I think, uh, coming from IBM. IBM usually calls a tag store as a tag directory. Uh, this is basically a tag store, what we've seen earlier. Uh, you can have a main, main tag store. This is the tag store that is actually used to keep track of the block addresses present in the cache. This is actually uh, the tags of the blocks that are in the cache at the, point, at the moment. But you can also have auxiliary tag stores where you can simulate or emulate anything, right? You can have, let's say, an auxiliary tag directory for policy X. This is a tag store that is used to emulate a policy X. Basically, it's not used for tracking the block addresses that are currently present in the cache, but it's used for tracking what the block addresses in the cache would have been if we were actually following some policy X. That's different from what's in the main tag store. Make sense? Now you're an architect. You can actually come up with any kind of policy and do it. OK, so basically, that, that's the idea over here. You have a main tag directory for a given set. Let's take a look at the single set. This is also called tournament selection. But, uh, and actually, we will probably talk about branch prediction at some point. But there are hybrid branch predictors that operate based on the same principles. You have different branch prediction algorithms. For some branches, this, is, uh, this algorithm is good. For some other branches, this algorithm is good. Why not implement both and select the best algorithm 
depending on which branch you're executing or which point in the program you are in. That's called a tournament predictor. That tournament predictor is coined by Alpha Digital Equipment Corporation because they were one of the first to implement that hybrid branch predictor. They called it tournament selection, tournament predictor. You, may, you have a tournament between multiple policies, basically. And the winner takes it all. <laughs> that becomes the main policy. So let's take a look at how this is done. This is the main tag, tag directory. So you basically have different tags for the same set, auxiliary tag directory, uh, following different policies. Right? And you have, a, let's say, a counter that decides. In this case, it could be a saturating counter. If this policy is doing better, you increment the counter. If this policy is doing better, you decrement the counter. Some, some way of deciding, basically. The paper has a different way, but you can read the paper, look at the details. But this, basically, this counter uh, is incremented for one policy and decremented for the other policy. And this is one way of doing it. If both policies are hit, you may have the counter unchanged. If both policies are missing, you may have the counter unchanged again. If one policy hits and the other policy misses, you may adjust the counter such that it's biased towards the policy that's hitting. And if one policy, policy misses and the other policy hits, you may adjust the counter such that the winning policy or the hitting policy actually is biased, right? Such that you're going to select that policy. And exactly how this is done, you can read the paper. You can take into account the miss rate or you can take into account the cost of a miss, right? I won't go into the detail. There, there's a huge design space over there also. But the key idea is you have two different policies implemented in the different tag directories or tag stores, and you keep track of which one is doing better, and this counter summarizes which one is doing better for that set. And this is one way of decision, for example. If uh, the counter is biased toward this policy, pick that one. Otherwise, it pick the other one. Right. So you can actually have, actually, this is not the worst possible case, but uh, you can have a single counter for all sets, but you can also imagine having a separate counter for different sets, such that each set, um, each set can have a, a policy decided by only itself. Now, this is Im Im basically implementing this selection on a per set basis. Having a single counter per set is expensive, so you can reduce the counter overhead by using a single global counter. That's one approximation, right? Now you've lost per set information if you do that. But you've got rid of a lot of counters. That's a lot of counters otherwise, right? Depending on how big your counters are. But even this is expensive, right? If you look at this, let's assume that you have, I don't know, 10,000 cash blocks in your cash. Do you have a, a tax store, one tax store here, another tax store here, and then another real tax store, main tag directory? That's tripling your tax store. That doesn't sound good, just to find the best replacement policy. So what do you do? So one option is not all sets are required to decide the best policy, assuming you're selecting a global policy. So have auxiliary tag directory entries only for a few sets. Sample, basically. Sampling is always good for getting rid of a lot of information and a lot of hardware overhead. You sample. You pick some number of sets, and the paper talks about how to pick some of them. Let's say you pick three out of 10,000. That's much less hardware cost. You just need to keep track of these three sets, right? That's good. And these are called the leader sets, BEG. And all of the other sets will have follower sets now. So basically, these auxiliary tag directory entries exist. None of, them, none of the other sets exist in the auxiliary tag directory. So the hope is that the ones that you pick are representative of the remaining parts of the cache. If they are, then the policy you pick by just looking at uh, which policy is doing better for these sets would be good for the entire cache. OK. So there, there's some theory behind this. How do you actually decide how many sets you choose for the best performing policy? So you can read the paper again. But it turns out if you have 32 leader sets, it's similar to having all sets in the auxiliary tag directory. And last level cache typically contains t thousands of tens of thousands of sets. So if you have only 32, it's not bad. <laughs> Basically, it's only uh, three to two to three percent of the sets. And you can also further reduce it by using the main tag directory to simulate one of the policies. Meaning, you don't need to have one of the tag directories over here, right? So what you can do is this. So set B, E, and G are followers. Uh, sorry, leaders, the green one, uh, the gray ones. They're always following policy one over here. 
and they're always uh, you have a separate tag directory that's always following policy two over here. So that way you reduce the cost even more. And these green guys are the followers. Those sets follow the best policy that's determined by uh, the choice that you made just by looking at policy one that's followed by these three sets and policy two that's followed by these three sets. Make sense? So that's, now we've simplified the cost even more because we got rid of the ATD for policy one and used the main tag directory to implement that ATD. Now, of course, there's a cost here, which is the green ones should implement both policies, right? So that's, that's the cost you pay, but there's no other way of getting around that, I think, uh, because you, have to, you want to choose between two policies. Okay, so I can read the paper again. So let me give you an overview of the paper. The paper, uh, not, not overview of the paper, but overview of the results if you do something like this. So the paper is trying to clearly do cost-aware cash replacement, right? Uh, so if you use a single policy, which is cost-aware, this is actually a cost-aware policy, uh, and the baseline is LRU, and this is IPC instruction per cycle improvements over LRU. Now the cost-aware policy is doing well for some workloads, as you see, right? But for some other workloads, LRU is doing really, really well. So if you actually use the cost of air policy, you lose 30% performance because that workload is friendly to LRU. So if you actually implement uh, this hybrid replacement, hopefully you get the best of both worlds. So this is where you're doing worse. And in this case, uh, the hybrid replacement is actually doing even better because there are phases of the program where cost of air is good. There are phases of the program where LRU is good. You're picking the best one over time. Make sense? So uh, basically, S bar is the hybrid replacement. So uh, compared to uh, LRU, you're not losing much performance for the LRU friendly workloads, and you're gaining almost all the benefit for the cost aware friendly workloads, and you're doing even better than both for those workloads that sometimes do better with uh, one policy versus the other over time. So this is an example of the workload that does better. So this is time, execution time, and this is the instructions per cycle performance. If you use the LRU policy, this is the IPC performance that you would get for that interval, given time interval. So initially, this particular workload, I think it's AMMP, uh, basically uh, LRU is bad, worse than uh, this linear policy, which is really a cost-aware policy. You'll read the paper and you'll figure it out. But later, LRU becomes better. Now you can adapt to it, right? If you use a hybrid replacement policy, you can adapt to the best one. And this is the curve that's followed in reality by the hybrid replacement policy. So over here, it follows almost lin. Sometimes it does better because it gets rid of the interference. Over here, it follows the other one. OK. So this having a choice enables you to adapt to program phases, not only to different programs, but also to program phases. Of course, how quickly you can decide you can change the policy makes a difference also, right? We didn't talk about that uh, as much. But ideally, you would like to get uh, the best of multiple different policies like this. So you can, think, you can make the same thought experiment with LRU versus random also. Right? OK, any questions on this? Does this sound like fun? Yes? So this is executing the program only once. So within the program, you're cho it's choosing the best policy. Right. Exactly, yeah. So because it's happening in hardware at that point in time. You're not running the program once, finding the best policy, and then doing it. It's really happening in, while the program is executing. It's not a, it's not a, it's a, uh, a pre-execution time profiling mechanism. It's not that. Any other questions? OK, so let's talk about multiple outstanding misses, because since we're talking about memory level parallelism, uh, there, is a way, there should be a way to support these multiple outstanding misses, right? If your cache can support only one outstanding miss, and then you cannot support anything else, well, you have a problem, right? That's actually a pretty poor design. So basically, the key question is, if the processor can generate multiple cache accesses, can the later access be handled while a previous miss is outstanding? 
And the goal is to enable cache access when there is a pending miss. In fact, enable cache misses. Enable multiple misses in parallel. This is called memory level parallelism, as we discussed. So the solution is very, actually, in hindsight, very simple, but this was developed uh, in, for 30 years ago, so I'm going to talk about it briefly. The solution is a non blocking cache. Basically, the cache is not blocking while servicing an, a, a, an access or a miss. The cache is non blocking. Another miss can be serviced while this miss is being serviced also, or lockup free. And this is uh, described in this paper by Croft, I guess, 36 years ago. Uh, and the idea is very simple, basically. You need to have another buffer. Right, that's the idea. You need to keep track of the status and data of the misses that are being handled by the cache in some other buffer. That buffer in today, today's process is called miss status handling registers or miss buffers or miss request buffers. And a cache access, whenever you access a, access a cache, uh, let's say you miss in the cache, you check the MSHRs. That's called an MSHR also, miss status handling registers. If a miss to the same block is already pending, if it's pending, a new request is not generated. It makes no sense to generate a new request, of course, because there's already an outstanding request. And if pending and the needed data is available, you can forward the data from this buffer. So you can actually buffer the part of the data over there. So for example, uh, you, you, you're fetching a 64-byte block, but only eight bytes of it are here in the missed status handling buffer. So you can just forward that data, those eight bytes, if you need that one. Uh, this requires buffering of outstanding miss requests, of course. It's also called a miss buffer. You keep track of outstanding cache misses. And also pending load and store accesses that refer to the missing cache block. So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, so miss buffers have, of course, like every other hardware structure, you need to have some uh, fields, like a valid bit, meaning there's a pending miss tracked by this buffer entry. Cache block address, which cache block is we're waiting for. Some control and status bits, which we're not well, you may talk about which sub-blocks have arrived, for example. If you have a large block, you may keep track of which sub-blocks have arrived and the data for each sub-block. And also, for each pending load and store that's waiting for that block. Because what happens when the data comes back, you need to supply the data to the load or store that's waiting for it, right? You need to have a link between the pipeline and the cache. Right? That's, the, that's the reason why you uh, need to know the load or store. Now, this, of course, more important if you're, uh, if you're at the L1 level. If you're at the L2 level, you may not need to know which load or store, right? Let's take a look at it. So this is one entry in the missed status handling register. This is one valid bit. This is the block that is missed. Is it issued? I mean, you don't need to, you don't need to worry about exact uh, details over here, but this is one example. Again, you can implement it in different ways. And these are the loads and stores that are waiting for this block. So when the block comes back, what the cache logic does is it goes and supplies the necessary data to those loads and stores. That's one way of doing it. Another way is the cache logic says when the block comes back, you go and wake up all of those loads and stores, and the loads and stores re-execute and re-access the cache. Right. Hopefully that data is already in the cache because you've just supplied the data. Okay. Again, you don't need to know the fields really well over here, uh, but for example, uh, this, if this is valid, you may have a load, this is the type, waiting for block six in this uh, large, uh, uh, sub block six uh, in this block, and the destination should be, which basically this should be a link to that particular load, maybe load five in the machine, right? Okay, so on a cache miss, you need to search the miss buffers or MSHRs for a pending access to the same block. If you find, you allocate a load store entry in the same MSHR entry. If you don't find, you allocate a new MSHR, new miss buffer, hopefully one is present. And if there's no free entry, you just stall. So this may affect your performance. For example, if your program generates 128 misses in parallel, whereas you have only eight miss buffers, you cannot sustain all of those misses in parallel because you run out of the miss buffer entries, right? assuming they all need different misbuffer entries. That used to be the case, actually, uh, in a lot of Intel Pentium 4 processors. You could have an instruction window that's 126, uh, that can have 126 instructions, but the misbuffers were eight entries. I hope they changed that. <laughs> uh, and that's actually the, pa the paper that's one pager that I'm going to reference at the end talks about we need to actually enable more memory level parallelism. So that's, uh, okay, anyway. When a sub-block returns from the next level in memory, uh, you check which loads and stores are waiting for it. 
and forward the data to the load store unit. That's one way of doing it again. And you deallocate uh, the load store entry in the MSHR entry, right? And write the sub block in the cache or MSHR. Again, you have a policy over here. There are many design choices. You're designing the cache itself. If this is the last sub block that you're waiting for for that block, you deallocate the MSHR because now you've gotten the cache block, full cache block. Nobody else should be waiting for it. Of course, you should deallocate the miss buffer after writing the block into the cache. Hopefully, this is simple. So there are, many que there are some questions over here. When do you access the MSHRs? Do you do it in parallel with the cache or after the cache access is complete? Again, another design choice, serial versus parallel, right? Because MSHR is really a buffer of stuff that's waiting to get into the cache, right? Uh, usually, MSHRs need not be on the critical path of hit requests, right? Uh, so the, usually, a cache hit is the common case, and cache miss and MSHR is the uncommon case. So you don't want to put the MSHRs into the critical path of your cache, L1 cache access. That's why usually you access MSHRs after the cache access is complete, after you know whether you have a cache hit or a cache miss. But of course, it's a design choice. As long as you don't lengthen your critical path, you may, do, you may start this access in parallel. Right? For example, you may uh, start the access in parallel. If you get a cache hit signal, you just take stuff in the, from the cache. If you have an MSHR hit signal, maybe that comes a little bit later. You take that. Now you have variable latency access that may complicate the scheduling that happens in the processor, right? So if you have an order order scheduler, it needs to tolerate these latencies somehow. OK, I won't go into that. Any questions on this? I've just covered MIS buffers very quickly. But hopefully, conceptually, it's, there's nothing difficult about MIS buffers. It's essentially the buffer of pending misses. No questions? That means I should talk about non uh, enabling high bandwidth memories? Maybe not, because I don't think uh, we're going to finish uh, the high bandwidth memory part, even though I hope to. <laughs> but if we start this, we'll, uh, we'll be here for 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't think, do, do you guys want to be here for 10 minutes? Who says yes? OK, if people are tired, I think. Well, some people need to want to be, I guess. Who says no? OK, good. Yeah, I don't think I want to be here for 10 minutes, because I think this is a lot of material. But if there, are there any questions so far on whatever we've covered in this lecture? Any burning questions? No, everything is clear. So if I ask you a very difficult question next time, you'll be able to give me the answer like this. Everything is clear doesn't mean that, right? <laughs> OK, good. I'll see you tomorrow.